All right, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, the Town Commission Workshop on March 6, 2021 at 9 a.m. Uh, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the great republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> All right, and let's do roll call, Town Clerk. Mayor Mayfield? Here. Vice Mayor Campo? Yes. Commissioner Fender? Still in bed. Commissioner Kurzman? Yes. Commissioner Tompak? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, I want to welcome everybody here um, for a fun Saturday workshop instead of the typical Tuesday. Um, we are here to continue the discussion that we started last year under Mayor Fender um, when we addressed the town's strategic priorities. Uh, we have two, the bulk of the day, or the morning, I should say, um, is with two presentations. We have uh, independent third-party speakers with us. Um, first up, at 9.30 to 11.30, we have um, Dr. Kim Delaney from the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. And she's going to join us and facilitate the conversation where we take these priorities and kind of structure a blueprint for financing options for priority projects. And then at 11.30, we have Bonnie Landry, who is um, an independent planner and consultant who is working with us on rewriting our comprehensive plan. And she, I believe she has some fun public participation opportunities, which I think could be very engaging and great for the town. Um, and then before we get to the bulk of the meeting, we have a uh, Sam Emerson with us, the director of Martin County Utilities. Um, he's gonna give us a high level presentation and um, fill us in on the information he's got. So, uh, but before we get to that, we're gonna have any public to be heard. I do not see any public comment, April, okay. All right, then I give it, a, Sam, can you take it away, please? Sure, thank you and good morning, Sam Emerson, for the record, Mark Kenny, Utility Solid Waste uh, uh, Director. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and present to you a brief presentation I promise I'll be brief <laughs> and uh, just give you an overview of the large sewer uh, system program did you want Airbag, the world leader in vacuum sewer technology we improve the quality of life throughout the world by providing economical and ecological wastewater solutions once you see vacuum technology in action you'll understand why so many municipalities and developers are installing airbag vacuum sewer systems. For the customer, an airbag system works just like any other sewer system. Traditional gravity lines carry wastewater from the source to an airbag valve pit. When 10 gallons of wastewater collects in the sump, the airbag valve opens and differential pressure propels the contents into the vacuum main. Wastewater travels at 15 to 18 feet per second in the vacuum main to the vacuum station. The vacuum main is laid in a sawtooth fashion to ensure adequate vacuum levels at the end of each line. At the vacuum station, vacuum pumps cycle on and off as needed to maintain a constant level of vacuum on the entire system. Wastewater enters the collection tank, and when the tank fills to a predetermined level, sewage pumps transfer the contents to the treatment plant via a force pump. The airbag valve pit is typically located near the street and is remarkably simple, consisting of only a few components. An upper valve chamber and lower sewage sump chamber separated by a solid barrier. The vacuum interface valve, the sump breather unit, and a cast iron cover. Sewage flows from the customer through a gravity line and enters the lower holding zone. When 10 gallons are accumulated, the valve opens pneumatically. No electricity is required at the valve. Blockages are extremely rare. Large debris simply passes through the valve and into the vacuum main. The upper and lower chambers are completely separated by a solid barrier. If the valve ever needs servicing, maintenance workers do not come in contact with sewage. When sewage leaves the valve pit, differential air pressure propels it through the vacuum mains. Vacuum mains feature the distinctive sawtooth profile, which prevents sewage from blocking the line during low flow periods. The sawtooth profile consists of a series of lifts. Sewage lies at the bottom of these lifts under negative pressure until valves along the line open and air and atmospheric pressure enter the pipe network. The resulting pressure differential propels the sewage towards the vacuum station at up to 18 feet per second, scouring the pipes and keeping the sewer lines clean and free of obstructions. 
change orders. Once installed, the vacuum mains are easy to service. While extremely rare, leaks would not result in sewage spills, but rather air would enter the pipe and would be immediately detected. An alarm system would notify operating personnel who can easily isolate and quickly repair the leak. This protects ground and surface water from pollution and also prevents system infiltration that can lead to additional treatment expenses. Vacuum stations consist of three main parts, the vacuum pumps, a collection tank, and sewage pumps. The vacuum pumps cycle on and off to create negative pressure in the collection tank and throughout the system. When the collection tank fills to a predetermined level, a sewage pump transfers the contents from the tank to the force main and then to the treatment plant. In the event of a power outage, an alarm will alert operators and standby generators will provide uninterrupted service. One airbag vacuum station typically replaces multiple lift stations, resulting in cost savings and more land available for other purposes. Airbag assembles and tests the mechanical and electrical equipment of the vacuum station at its factory. The skid mounted equipment is delivered to the job site and placed into the vacuum station building. It's sometimes difficult to spot an airbag vacuum station because these facilities can be designed to fit the architecture of their neighborhoods. Because vacuum sewers are a closed system and the vacuum stations remain clean and odorless, they can be located almost anywhere, near parks, schools, or in residential areas. Future generations will insist upon a sewer system that is not only cost effective, but also environmentally sound. The airbag vacuum sewer system gives you these benefits now. It's a proven technology with a long history of success and reliability. Ask any public works official or developer who has installed an airbag vacuum sewer system, and they will convince you that vacuum sewers are the economical and ecological wastewater solution. Airbag, the world leader in vacuum sewer technology. So when's the last time you saw a video clip that exciting? <laughs> yeah, pretty I don't know, John Tom Peck was like this. <laughs> I was excited. <laughs> tell you. Engineers get excited. Airbag, the world oh, leader. The, my bad. Excuse me. Once is enough. <laughs> so exciting, we got to watch it twice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Sam. Did you want to... Are you waiting for more to appear? Gotcha. Yes. I've just got a few slides I'd like okay. to share with you um, on the county's uh, septic sewer program. We have two programs. Uh, you're familiar with the grinder sewer program, which you're utilizing on North Sewell's Point. And so uh, I want to go over the vacuum sewer system that we utilize for our larger communities. Uh, on December of 2018, the Board of County Commissioners approved the large sewer program along with their um, Connect to Protect policy. And this one addresses communities uh, greater than 300 units. Our grinder sewer that you're familiar with serves units uh, or communities and neighborhoods with fewer than 300 because that's generally around the cost break uh, on uh, each of the systems. It's a vacuum assisted gravity sewer as you saw in the video. Very simple uh, uh, collection system. We utilize a 20 year special assessment. The county will create an MSBU, a, multi a municipal services benefit unit for that particular community. Uh, those costs for the program are accessible and they will go on the tax roll. They can be paid annually or can be paid in full the first year or paid the balance anytime thereafter. The policy um, was to try to keep a similar cost for this program for the residents, the same uh, throughout the community. We've developed a 10-year program with a five-year specific work plan, and we've been able to meet that goal thus far. So they wanted to cap that at $12,000 per unit. This requires an estimated $4 million annually in additional funds. And I wanted to make it clear that these are non-utility funds. These will be in the form of grants, uh, county MSTU, or franchise fees. We utilize uh, FPNL franchise fees to assist us 
and reducing those assessable costs. Uh, to date, the county has completed three uh, large vacuum sewer projects. One is in Seagate Harbor Lighthouse Point, which is Palm City, uh, waterfront community. Most of those are waterfront on canals. That was constructed about 15 years ago, 452 connections, and that's 100% connected. North River Shores Phase 1 was completed about 10 years ago. Uh, there were 434 homes, and 95% of those are connected. North River Shores Phase 2 we completed in July of 19, uh, about a year and a half ago. Out of the 303 uh, ERCs, it's 84% of those people have connected. So we've got a pretty good connection rate uh, for that investment. Uh, to give you uh, some, some of our costs that we've experienced, uh, North River Shores Phase 2 was the latest one we completed. That total project cost was $7 million. Additional funding totaled $3.5 million. So it was significant for that community. The total accessible cost was $3.5 million. And with that additional funding, we were able to meet the board's goal uh, of a cap of $12,000 per household. Without that funding, you can see uh, quite a bit difference. It's $23,000 per unit, not cost feasible in our opinion. technology <laughs> it's there it's just small somebody's using a Mac Saturday morning, we have all day. Say again? Yeah. So this is what we did Saturday morning, we have yeah. all day. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> I think it's a nice change. I do too. Okay. Help me get this open. Okay. I don't know if it's useful for you, but I printed last year's. So. The priority? Whatever we came out of last year. So yeah, I think that's Cool, thank you. Can you want to hand it out to all of us? Oh, you can if you want. I mean, sorry. Okay, we are ready to go. Sorry about that, guys. Just for the next section. Maybe one for Michelle, too. Yeah. Yeah, I'll send it down. Pass these down that way. Michelle, that's just for the next item, the priority. Okay. Is that where we were, Sam? Okay, we're ready? Great, yes. thank you. Um, the project we have currently under construction is Golden Gate Estates. This is located east of Dixie Highway, south of Indian Street. Uh, it's got 834 connections. The cost of that project was approximately $13 million. Uh, we received additional funding in the amount of $3.3 .3 million for a total accessible cost of $9.6 million. Again, we were able to meet the board's uh, objective of keeping the cap on that per connection uh, less than $12,000. Uh, without that funding, the cost would have been $15,000 per unit. Next, please. Um, once a project's completed, and we do this with 
either of our systems, the grinder or the vacuum system. Once it's uh, released by DEP, been certified, placed into service, we send a letter to everyone uh, in that MSBU. And each resident or property owner will receive a letter. It indicates uh, that the customer has 365 days to connect to the system, and that's per Florida statute. And those customers that do not connect, we begin billing the base sewer charge. It's approximately $18 per month. And that's just the standby charge for that service. We haven't physically, we, we, the board does not want to, to force anyone to connect. Uh, it is mandatory in the sense that the assessment is mandatory and the statute requires uh, the customer to connect within the first year. But we don't necessarily try to enforce that. We simply add the base facility charge. Uh, as you saw in the uh, video clip, uh, these vacuum pump stations uh, are difficult to recognize or pick out if you're driving through a community. Uh, we try to match the architecture of that community and the roof styles, the building styles, the color schemes. You see this one, uh, metal roof. We have um, Bahama shutters, some railing on the side of the driveway, uh, and nicely landscaped. So it fits in the community very well. And we, uh, that is our, what we do with, with each of these projects. We want to match the neighborhood's architecture. This is a grant funding summary sheet. As I mentioned, one of the critical items of being successful and keeping those costs uh, down are additional funding, and that can be through uh, grants, it can be through franchise fees, MSTU, uh, millage, whatever you might choose. But we've utilized the combination of funding sources. Um, real quick, the FDEP SRF program, if you're not familiar with that, that's a state revolving fund loan program. They offer low interest loans for water and wastewater improvements. They require a facilities plan or a planning document to be submitted for each project prior to applying uh, for the loan. In our case, we thought it would be wise to go ahead and do a 10-year planning document. And that way, the DEP, which is a grant agency right next door in the same building, with the SRF uh, department, they are aware and they have copies of our planning documents as well. And so instead of going project by project, we've outlined a 10-year plan. Smart. The 10-year plan was approximately $160 million. And so this includes our grinder sewers, our vacuum sewers, and also our water assessments. We've got a number of communities that are on well and, well and septic. And then they petition the commission, we take votes. If the majority wants water, then we do an assessment for water system. We always do that before we put in sewer. And real quick, we've got FDEP non-point non source grants. What this does uh, is provide for the connection side not the infrastructure. So the 319 is a federal grant. And in Golden Gate, we've got $750,000. And what we do is we utilize that. And so we'll give 500 vacuum sewer customers, when that comes online, a $1,000 discount to install their lateral and abandon the septic tank. Typical costs are about $2,500. And so that will assist them in reducing their cost to connect we did the same procedure on um, in uh, Old Palm City. There we've been awarded $850,000 and we'll provide a discount to 750 vacuum customers and 100 grinder customers throughout the service area. The Indian River Lagoon Council has been very supportive of our program. We've received $150,000 uh, from them for FY21 and that will give thousand dollar discount for those who wish to connect to the grinder sewer program in the first year that service is available we recently applied and been given notice that we've been awarded an additional hundred fifty thousand dollars for another hundred fifty grinder program applicants to receive a discount and then as far as the water management district we recently were awarded 2.5 million dollars for Old Palm City and that's for infrastructure to reduce the cost uh, on the assessments. And then 
we've also received a water quality restoration grant in the amount of $2 million that we've applied to the Golden Gate subdivision that's under construction. So those are some of the um, available resources to, uh, to, to reduce that cost and provide the additional funds for the program. And I think for our last count, you've got 652 septic tanks remaining and some <coughs> tools point. Actually, that's probably the number of parcels you have. We've discovered that a number of homes have put additions on their home, additional bedroom or enhancements, and we found multiple septic tanks uh, on the property. And that really is just a cost the homeowner would bear in the abandonment of any, anything more than one septic tank. And with that, I will be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fender. I was just going to thank Sam for an excellent presentation, which I've noticed has become the hallmark of his presentations here on this topic. Compared to all the ones we've seen, yours are always so cleanly delivered. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. All right, Commissioner Kurzman. Yes, I, I will make a comment. Um, I was one with Joe Camper to see the one that you have in North River Shores. There's two locations there. And I went in a little bit skeptic because I was thinking about the smells. There was no smell at all. Um, I, I was amazed how immaculately clean everything was. My biggest concern was the people that live next door to the facilities. And really, it's quiet. There's no smell. Um, it's not a nice or it looks like a house when you see it. Uh, the question I'm going to have is the structure, would that be covered with funding? So we're going to need either a home or build something that resembles a home. Whether it's behind this building here, I don't know where we put it, but you're going to need something like that. Would that also be covered? Yes, that's included in the project design and construction. And North River Shores, we had to acquire a vacant lot. Fortunately, we acquired a lot that was somewhat centrally located to that community. And that's what we try to do when you locate a vacuum system. You'd like it to be centrally located in the area that you plan to serve. And I appreciate your comments. There are, we've had no odor complaints, no odor experiences there. We have a biofilter system. So any of the um, gases that may come out of the system go through a mulch bed. It's a very large mulch bed about the size of this room and it's called a biofilter, so that gets additional treatment for anything that might escape from the system. No complaints from neighbors uh, at all at this point. I did want to point out in the video clip, you saw they mentioned that there's generator power. You saw that generator was outside the building. Our generators are inside a building with some soundproofing and louvers for air cooling. So we, we've had no issues with complaints on noise or odor. And the other question, it's $11,708 per home to hook up into this. Is there any additional fees the homeowner is going to incur? The homeowner would be responsible for connecting from the street to the house and abandonment of the septic tank. And, and North River Shores phase two, um, my administration was a little skeptic and the staff, but I convinced them that if we go out to bid and hire a contractor competitive bid and we did a typical distance from the house to the valve pit and abandonment of the septic tank we received bids for two thousand one hundred seventy seven dollars to make those connections so customer can come in sign up for the sewer we coordinate contractor with the customer the customer hasn't got to coordinate anything our contractor goes on site makes the connection, abandons the tank, and then restores the yard. And so we were able to keep that cost to a minimum because as we were doing it as a utility, the health department waived the safety tank abandonment fee, and the building department waived the building permit fee or plumbing permit fee. So we were able to keep that at a pretty reasonable cost. We were seeing others in the community that wanted to do that on their own, and they were $3,000 to $3,500 for that same service. So the customers really like the county being responsible for making that connection. And the, let's say you have a person that's going to be a holdout. So you mentioned $18 a month would be the charge per month if not connected. Can they do this for five or 10 years? 
or eventually you're going to say enough's enough? No, the board has not, did not want to implement any uh, type of ordinance or mandatory forced connection to the system. But as you can see, um, in the three communities that have been completed to date, we've got 84 to 100 percent connection which I think was outstanding. I was really impressed with North River Shores Phase 2. I, I didn't realize that many would connect that quickly. But giving them a $1,000 discount to connect early is, is very helpful. Okay. <coughs> I appreciate it. And the other question I was going to ask was, The, once again, I'm going to repeat, the 11,708 is not going to turn to 13,000 or 14,000. That's going to be a firm number? No. no. The number I, sh I showed you, uh, one it's neighborhood it's was 15,000, one was $23,000. Oh. The one at 15,000 was Golden Gate. They had 800 units. So typically when you have a large community versus 300 units, you're going to have a lower unit cost because you're spreading across that lift station among more more properties so no it can range from fifteen thousand to twenty three thousand dollars in our series so that's where that additional funding is critical in order to keep a cap in our case of twelve thousand dollars per unit okay all right thank you uh commissioner tom peck um i have about a thousand questions but i'm not going to torture you with all of them today i was wondering if um michelle if you could send us the powerpoint and uh, Yes, sir. <clears throat> I was curious, in the um, video they showed everything being uh, trenched. I assume we can directionally bore some of this? No, this uh, has to be laid on grade, a 2% slope, a 0.2% slope for 100 feet plus, and then you'll see he mentioned a sawtooth design. It's 0.2% slope, about half the slope of an 8-inch gravity sewer, and then it jumps up. and then it, continues that repeats that slope so it's a continuous <coughs> softening so it's actually a gravity flow and then the vacuum is used to lift to the next gravity segment so it is it's really vacuum assisted gravity is what will be tearing up all the streets uh streets uh right of way edge of road it depends on the, the final design if the right of way is constricted we'll be in the street we, we found it better in North River Shores and, and the previous projects, too. If there are numerous paver driveways, uh, textured concrete driveways, we go out in the street to avoid disruption of those driveways. They're hard to match when a driveway's been installed, whether it be textured concrete or pavers over time. They fade, and then if you come in and cut that, it's just so hard to match it, and it's it just doesn't look good so we prefer to stay in the street in those instances and what was the uh, duration of the uh, north river shores phase one project north river shores the sewer construction was approximately a year uh, the entire project we we tried really hard to coordinate with our public works department they're doing neighborhood restorations where they go in and replace uh, drain pipes and culverts, re reduce swales. We'll come in and then do the sewer install. They'll come in after the sewer install is complete and mill and resurface all the streets. So when we leave those neighborhoods where we've done a joint project, everything's been replaced. They've got water, sewer, drainage, new roads. So they're good for 15 to 20 years without returning for maintenance or repair and you talked a little bit about that uh, commissioner Kurzman mentioned the 18 dollars per month essentially a readiness to serve charge that's correct and the uh, at the same time the assessment is already on the books right there's yes the assessment is effective on august 1st of each year of, of a year for that particular development <laughs> one thing we're doing um in Golden Gate, we received a state revolving fund loan for that, a 0% interest. It was amazing. Uh, typically, those are less than 2%. Recently, they've been less than 0.5%, and we were fortunate to get a 0% loan. It's a 20-year loan. It matches our assessment period. And the, the great thing about the SRF, com 
compared to a bank loan or a conventional loan, on a bank loan, those payments are due immediately. Golden Gate is a two-year construction project because of the size. So with the SRF, we don't start repaying that loan until after construction is complete and certified. So they won't be getting an assessment for two years until the construction is complete. So we thought that was a real plus for, those, for that community to be able to delay the payment of those assessments until the project was constructed and they could connect. Uh, just one other one other question. I'm just curious about how your uh, your system works. Obviously, you have a capital improvement plan, and part of that capital improvement plan is system expansion. And I assume that you're utilizing uh, impact fees as kind of a pay-ahead program. No, our vacuum sewer is a strictly assessment. Okay, so you don't you don't utilize any of your accumulated capital improvement charges for this kind of an expansion not for the assessment program no it's completely funded through the assessment or additional funding okay but not not utility funds as I mentioned in the slide no utility funds are utilized there okay thank you Commissioner Commissioner Campo great to see you Sam thanks for being here thank you it's good to be here thank you um, you know we're gonna we're gonna start exploring something that capitalized on the success in North Sewell's Point. And I was available and working with John Polly at the time. So I think we've got some success to show. And the boogeyman didn't show up. And you know, the, the uh, sinkholes didn't materialize. And conspiracies didn't uh, come to fruition. But uh, my experience with this is we could have consultants, we could have engineers, we could have charrettes. But until we can answer to the residents how much it's going to cost, it's a lot of wasted energy. So I wanted to just point out to, to Dave that those examples of other neighborhoods are basically imaginary numbers or have no real relevance to us. So uh, when you start talking about paying for something and you know, not getting anything, $18 a month, it, it's controversial. So um, before we rev it up the engines too much, I think we need to have some, you know, real hard numbers. And the soft costs, the engineering costs, or the right of way, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that go into it. But I think until we come up with a firm number, this is going to be a hard sell. And I will tell you, I know Mr. Kapp has looked at our systems. We've shared information and cost on our program. And as I mentioned, 15000 in a large neighborhood to 23000 in a small neighborhood. You're somewhere between that at 650 or so. Um, we can do the math based on that and do some estimates. But I will tell you, you won't have hard numbers until you advertise for competitive bids and receive bids. That's when you get a number you can absolutely count on that will be your most firm number mm -hmm. but I know Joe's estimates that he's working on are based on our actual actual value like I said Golden Gate was the most recent we got really good pricing very competitive pricing on Golden Gate one thing I think that helped with that is we pre-selected five contractors we pre-qualified five contractors in advance and then those five were the only ones allowed to bid on the project. So I think that assisted us in getting uh, good, good pricing. Thank you. Commissioner Vendor, do you have? Sure. <clears throat> so this is the first time for me that the light's coming on that we can't directionally bore this. And the video showed some pretty gaping uh, construction requirements. So uh, two things. I'm sure your crews are awesome. Uh, so I'm hoping that there's some plan in place to uh, we'll get around our tree roots and things because we're highly protective of our trees around here. And lastly, um, in coordination with our multi-phase project to raise South Souls Point Road, I'm wondering if, if some of that saw truth work had been done, at least on phase one, or do we have to dig all that back up again to do it, or do we have a plan to, to work around that somehow? So, I don't have any experience with installing 
vacuum system, say a dry line with other construction um, in advance a year or two, three down the road to actually complete a vacuum system. Um, I know Joe has been in contact with our consultants, Giffels Webster. We utilize them for all our vacuum designs because they specialize in that. We've had great success with their designs. They're, they're extremely knowledgeable. Um, they would be able to answer that question better than I. I just don't have sure. experience in doing that in advance. Sure. Well, I think one of the reasons we embarked on the road raising process and, and brought all these parameters into play was so that we could get them all done at once. So now it's starting to feel like we may have to dig the road up again afterwards. So I'm sure you can correct my, my misinterpretation of that. Um, Mr. <coughs> Fender, real quick before you get started, I just want to remind everyone that this is, you know, this was a, a bit of a higher level view. And, you know, we did have the meeting back in December with the resolution to in the future do this. Um, and I think the bottom line when I've had discussions with Martin County Utilities and everyone else that the town wants to keep the cost low and we need money to keep it low. Absolutely. And so we can't get the exact numbers to Commissioner Campos points and get so detailed so we um, get money and our, so this is just to keep the ball rolling and keep us thinking about it. Um, sure, but sure. just wanted to remind everyone of that. Joe? Yeah, I didn't want to go into too much detail. And again, these are, we, I just wanted to make sure that you know that we have been looking at things and, and getting a better understanding. And I have spoken to the county numerous times about numbers and, and costs and so forth. So we, we're not really looking at this like we don't have an understanding of where this is going, OK? So to make sure, you, and I'm just going to throw some things out there. First of all, we do know that a study needs to be done, as, as Commissioner Campbell pointed out, for two reasons. Number one, that needs to help us get grants. And number two, to get a better better feel for the cost. and, and the, you know, really, we just need to have that, and we've got a quote for that for somebody to do that with the people that works for the county. Um, just to give you a, a feel for this, and again, I don't want to go too far out there on some of the details, but this, if you add up design cost, construction cost, repairing the road cost, um, the capital facility charges that these people pay for when they hook up and everything, you're talking about something in the area of $15.8 million total, okay? And if you look at the $12,000 figure for what they would pay as a maximum, you know, they're paying for about half of that, okay? So we have to find grants for the other half. That's what we're trying to tell you here, or some other funding source to get that to happen. And um, so I just want you to know, um, we have thought about the road improvements, and that is the reason why we want to make sure you know, as we tear up South Sewell's Point from phase one area that we're in now, as we work our way north, we're tearing it up for stormwater improvements. Now is the time to tear it up for these improvements. And that's, the, that's what the county's been doing on all of their communities. They basically take money from their public works group that are repairing roads and fixing roads and drainage, and they do them at the same time they're doing this. So you basically see the benefit of cost of, the, the benefit from doing both of them at the same time. Um, you know, the, you may say, well, these numbers get look pretty high, but when you think about, we have a town, remember, we have a town that we need to know where the rights away are, a little more exact, okay? That alone's a $400,000 endeavor by a surveyor, just so you know, in South Sewell's Point. We've quote, we, we've got a price on those things. So I want you to know we have been pricing things. We've been using what the county's experienced so far. Uh, if you want to look at the next steps, the next steps are, you know, we need to first of all sign an interlocal agreement with the county because they have to be a partner with us on this and going after all these, these grants in some ways, but also kind of helping us through the process. We need to find a location of this vacuum building. That is the one, the main item that we need to do because the, as we have noted on finding drainage problem or projects to find retention areas, we have a lack of land. Everybody's building on it. I mean, I, I just went down the street today just to kind of make sure I knew what wasn't being built on because every time I turn around, Jack put another building permit on <laughs> So the point is, is we've got a limited, right, li lim limited land out there to use this building in. We'd like to use the property next door. That's going to take a study to see if that works. It's a very long distance to South Sewell's Point, probably a little more than what they would normally consider optimum for that system. So you're going to be using a different, you're going to be using a variety of systems tying into the vacuum system. You have barrier islands that we have to get across. So the vacuum system on the other side has to be adjusted 
to maybe a grinder system there that comes to and ties to the vacuum system. So you have a few little things here, but you know the number of 12,000 connection is really, I think, the one that you want to keep in mind. That's that's what we're looking for, and uh, you know, and basically the other one was 2,100 that they bid, but we've been using $2,500 per connection for each person to consider what they have to spend on their own property. And to me, those are the two numbers that you're really, that's what we're shooting for at this point. And that's a little different than we did up in North School's Point, right? We were at 8,000 up there, and that's what we're trying to tell you. That's gonna be a little bit more for this system. Uh, the vacuum system by itself is a great system. A lot of these systems, as they get older, the gravity systems that you typically hear about, there's a lot of infiltration of water. That's not a good system and that's not gonna accomplish the goal of cleaning up the river for us, right? Mm -hmm. So this system is, is, is good for that reason too. Well, the numbers are super important, but that really wasn't my question, right? I mean, we're, right. I'm looking at the technical detail of what we're putting under the ground while we're tearing it up once instead of tearing it up twice. In the area you're talking about, we do have some easements adjacent to the work we're working on now. Mm -hmm. and so we would probably put the vacuum systems in those areas, okay? Because as you know, in the area that we have a limited right away of only 30 feet of right away, there's about five lots mm -hmm. down there. Um, the manager was able to get some easements from those adjacent properties, all but one, okay? Um, but the fact of the matter is, we would put the vacuum system in that adjacent uh, easement area for what we're building now. A lot of the other parts of the- On the east side of the road, where there's nothing built. Actually on the, it's actually on the side of the road where the houses are, which is good because that puts the, the sewer line- To the, the west of the actual concrete you've already laid? It's, a it's gonna be adjacent. It's gonna be actually within that. 10 feet of that. Yeah. Within 10 feet of that towards the west of the, pro, of the, of the road. Okay, um, town manager has been waiting for- Okay. Hi, Tom Manager. Thank you. So today was really a, a high level view so we could start the discussion and really take a look at the product itself and get some more product knowledge on the issue itself. One of the things I would say, I want to start off by um, addressing the issue of we need to know the cost and that is a true statement. In so many ways, this is a chicken and egg issue. We need to know the cost before we get into an interlocal agreement with the county. However, the county is not going to get into an interlocal agreement until we say that we're ready to move into accepting a burden of that cost, right? And we, in so many ways, have to walk this path hand in hand with those partners at the county. And it's just my opinion, but based on my experience uh, in these last year, there's no better partners to do this with. I mean, you have a commission, your fellow partners, your peers that are over there that are committed to this Connect to Protect program and have really done the due diligence to make sure that the burden does not, um, is not felt by the residents. And so they've created the resolution, much like you, that uh, says that it, they don't want it to ex exceed a certain number. And I believe that number is $12,000, yes? And so Sam says yes. And so, so many parameters have been set up to protect the resident, the taxpayer, the home, the property owner. And we are doing the same things. And so in pursuit of funding, there's always the goal of making sure the burden stays less than that. And that's pretty incredible because you can ask any, there are two people sitting up here right now. We have your finance director on the other side and myself that have lived in other uh, counties and spend 25,000 for the same issue, you know, for the same type of service. And, and here to be able to get that for 12,000 and it be actually a more, a, a better service with the vacuum system is great. So um, when you, from a cost standpoint, the last thing I wanna say about that is we've gone out to uh, bid on, for construction on roads. You guys are familiar with that. That's your experience. We had an estimate. Basically, these are placeholders when we decide the estimate. Your original estimate on one phase of South Stools Point Road was 1.9 million. And so commissioners before you set aside monies for that. And unfortunately, that project, because it took so long, came in at 3 million. And we still moved forward. Why? Because the commitment was there. You understood that it was a priority. And at that point, we still pursued funding. The same thing would happen with a septic to sewer program. We do the best we can to get within the parameters that you give. And at that point, we pursue, but it's always done with placeholder ideas of what the construction costs are. And I think right now with the current um, 
projects that Sam offered you as examples, they're as close as they're going to get to uh, reality because it's currently happening. And there's no better time to move forward with trying to understand how to pay for it than when the state has been putting out these enormous amount of uh, funding opportunities as incentives to make that transition. Okay. Thank you, so Tom. I just wanted to touch on that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And um, uh, Commissioner Fender, did you have anything else you wanted no. to add? Or, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sam. I do appreciate Thanks. you taking your time out on a Saturday morning. Thank you. You're Did quite welcome. And I understand your concerns. Our, our board had some concerns going forward, but I was at a long range planning uh, workshop years ago with the Florida Stormwater Association. And, and we had a moderator there. We were trying to do some long range planning for our association, grow the association. And one of the things I learned, the takeaway was one of the principles of a high performance board is being able to make decisions without having all the answers. That's the challenge. That, that, that's the challenge that you have, and that's the challenge that the county has. But at a point, the, the board decided this was an environmental initiative, and they were commitment, uh, made the commitment, and they came up with additional funding because their mindset was, if we want to go apply for grants, if we don't have some skin in the game, if we're not committed as a board of county commissioners, it's going to fall on deaf ears. So I'll leave you with that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, it seems actually like a good segue into discussing our priorities and a blueprint for funding. So <coughs> Dr. Kim Delaney, thank you. Thanks, guys. Good morning. Um, Kim Delaney, for the record, uh, from Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. Protocol in the room. Would you prefer that I have the mask here to replace, or can I take the mask off behind the, the uh, screen? I don't know what the internal protocol is, and I just want to confess. I'd rather have you have it on. It on? Okay, I'll keep it on. So I'll, be, I'll do my best to uh, super jam. I'm the mask Nazi here, sorry. <laughs> totally good. So that's why I wanted to But I got point. dose one yesterday, so. Got it. So, um, uh, so thank you for the opportunity to work with you on uh, developing a strategic uh, priority blueprint. Um, the, um, we are, um, today's conversation is really a first step and probably no. will be several steps to get to the point where we have, um, I think, a just consensus on what you mm -hmm. think is appropriate as a, as a board uh, for what your strategic priorities should be, how they relate to one another, um, and how you, um, how you uh, amass the funding you need uh, to, bring those, to bring those projects to fruition. Damn. Kind of building on Sam's point, and I have a couple of slides to touch on this, um, and I listened actually to Vice Mayor Campos' uh, comments as the idea of having this workshop uh, were kicked around by the board. Um, uh, grant dollars are harder to secure. Um, it is a more competitive grant environment. Uh, the way I always look at grant dollars in every community is it's an opportunity to bring your tax dollars home, right? That's kind of what we're doing now with, with grant acquisition. Um, the best town dollars to spend are dollars that you can spend the same dollar in two, three, and four times, right? And leverage your local dollars um, against grants that you can layer one against the other. Um, it's a tricky process, uh, and to be competitive, um, you have to really advance the conversation and know where you want to go. And I have a couple of slides to touch on that as we get later into the presentation. Um, but getting positioned to be competitive for grants takes a lot of front end work. So, um, and that's where we see the best rewards. And I know that's a very strong interest for the town, so I wanted to lead with that as part of this conversation um, so that we work towards that at the tail end um, and I can get feedback from you on what the priorities are, how those things again relate to one another, um, and then what you think are the best strategies for you as a town um, to, to implement those projects in the most sustainable way for you. And that's however you define sustainability. So, um, so next slide. So the slides are a little small because we had a, a, <laughs> uh, a, a an HP versus Mac competition. <laughs> so Mac decided they would be PDF, and so they're a little smaller, but um, but bear with me if you will. So just an overview of really the remarkable resource that uh, is represented by Schools Point. Next slide. Uh, of course, uh, primary characteristic of the town um, is the relationship between the Indian River Lagoon and the St. Lucie River. Uh, it's an unparalleled location in the region, um, and, and we uh, at the Regional Planning Council, we're, we're so happy to have a chance to, to assist the town in this conversation because the things that you do as a town aren't just things that benefit your residents, right? But they really have a regional impact in how, um, how the town is managed and how 
how your projects are implemented because of your location um, and being um, so critically located near the inlet um, and between, uh, between the estuary and the river. Next slide. Um, and of course, why do people love Sewell's Point in the way they do? Um, we don't have views like this in many places in the region, and so you have resources to protect, um, and to protect those resources takes a level of investment. Next slide. Uh, the town has done a, a beautiful job in investing in its public places, and so um, parks like downtown Park and, um, uh, and ways to access the river um, are characteristics that, um, that set the town apart from, from others. Next slide. Um, and so again, focusing on the relationship between the Indian River Lagoon and the St. Lucie River um, is I really think the driver uh, in your capital projects conversation. Uh, the town manager shared with me a summary of the priorities um, that each of you look at individually and then um, collectively, um, I think you use as part of your uh, decision-making process. Um, there's, a, um, there's a constant theme among those priorities that, um, that she shared with me. Uh, from the five commissioners individually, um, and then in the public workshops that followed. So that balance between um, economic um, uh, economic controls um, and, and economic um, uh, economic balance you know, in how the town's finances are managed, with environmental stewardship and resiliency to keep and maintain a great place. Those are the themes across the board, and they vary between one and two depending on the individual. But those things are really partners to one another. I think how your management um, occurs. Next slide. Um, and so um, uh, of, the, of the challenges um, the town is facing, um, resiliency um, is, a, uh, is a regional, is, a, is an international challenge. Uh, at the regional scale, resiliency for us uh, focuses on king tide impacts. Um, however change has taken place over time, certainly change has been occurring. Um, and so uh, the stress on your capital infrastructure systems um, and the ability to maintain the quality of life in the town um, is directly tied to your ability to address resiliency. Go ahead, next slide. Um, and so, how do we handle resiliency as a community? Um, the town is really a leader with uh, the implementation of a number of best management practices regarding stormwater quality improvements um, and uh, uh, reducing nutrient loads. Beginning to have that conversation like you did this morning, looking at, um, looking at how you can convert from septic to sewer. Um, and then being prepared to handle hurricane impacts by looking at things like burying utility lines um, and raising the road uh, so that in the face of extreme events, then you still can function as a community. Next slide. Uh, again, the stormwater history, I have a little familiarity with the town stormwater history because frankly, I use it with other communities as a set of best manager practices. So thank you for that opportunity um, to share the successes that you have. Um, and as part of today's workshop and discussion, and again, this is this is the front end of what is going to be a longer conversation. Um, luckily, you have Joe Kaffer here as your town engineer, um, and we've been, uh, of course, leaning on Joe to help inform uh, the conversation. Um, the town's stormwater history, again, um, tied to your NPDES requirements um, and the kinds of things you'll address in your comprehensive plan, have a direct relationship to uh, the water quality that is the thing that reinforces your ad valorem base. Um, and again, those two things are tied together. Next slide. And of course, um, required by um, the town has its requirements to make sure that loop discharges um, are below the thresholds that are set by the permitting agencies. Next slide. Um, and what we know is um, the algae blooms that um, that have occurred over time and are projected to continue to occur uh, are going to be reliant on uh, the types of environmental remediation remediation activities uh, that are implemented by by local government. Next slide. Um, septic tanks, uh, um, there's a variety of opinion about septic tanks, uh, but what we know is there's no evidence that says septic tanks are good for the environment. There's just a question of how bad septic tank situation is. Um, these maps illustrate the Indian River Lagoon, uh, the presence of septic tanks and failures associated with them. Um, and so as you consider your capital projects, of the things you can control, there's a lot of things we can't control, right? We can't control when same tides are going to take place. All we can control is how we mitigate the impacts of those in our community. So how and when you raise the roadway network to be functional, how and when you convert septic to sewer so you don't have a, a continued contributed impact uh, to the lagoon in a negative way is a function of your capital projects prioritization. Um, and of course, we know what the impacts of those are. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, from an environmental standpoint. 
And one of the things that's notable about this, go ahead, go to the next one. There we go. Um, is the town has been extremely successful through partnerships with other entities. So Sam's conversation earlier uh, laid out an opportunity to be a partner with the county uh, in the uh, Connect to Protect program. Uh, the town has had remarkable success in reaching out to its partners that are elected officials, both locally, uh, at the state and federal level, uh, and in working with grant agencies who look to those partnerships to evidence their interest in funding your program. Right? So that kind of partnership activity uh, is, um, is how we bring costs down for residents. Um, it's also really how we get better projects because the grant agencies have different perspectives uh, and when you have and more advanced district and FEMA participating together to inform your project, you get more resilient projects as a result of that because of those agency, those agency requirements. Next slide. And so the idea to consider um, as we approach capital projects and their prioritization um, is the idea of sustainability. Um, yeah, and that means different things to different, uh, different local governments. Not every local government has the same balance of sustainability. So whatever the sustainable relationship is for the town, what would I want to try to do? get input from these about today. Sustainability is always kind of this classic Venn diagram. So there's a relationship between environmental conditions, uh, between the uh, economic responsibilities you take on and manage uh, as the elected officials in your community. Um, and then the social dynamics. What's the quality of life that you want to maintain? Those things are always in tandem. So you can, you can lean your investments in one direction or another. <clears throat> but the idea is you have a balanced approach that accomplishes the best quality of life condition with the, what you can afford, right, reasonably, um, uh, with the, the best um, uh, and, and ideally overperforming environmental condition, uh, environmental outcomes, again, considering just the geography of the town. Next slide. So, with that kind of backdrop, if you will, um, the capital improvements that have, um, have been uh, introduced at this point uh, are are represented on this slide. It's a little small, but we'll start with this one and then zoom in. So there's, of course, a series of capital investments that um, that are one-time investments, and then the maintenance responsibilities that come along with those. Mm -hmm. um, there are different financing mechanisms you can use to handle those one-time costs. Some of them can help you with perpetual maintenance, uh, uh, but uh, but not all of them. Go um, next slide. And so thinking about just the capital improvement side. Um, again, these are ideas that have been kicked about, so there's, there's, no, um, there's no pride of authorship, right? This is the beginning of a conversation. Um, this <coughs> is not a long enough list to represent all the capital projects that you really want to invest in in the community, um, but we want to have a starting point for conversation. Um, and so, um, and just for the benefit of the commission, um, in addition to helping develop your strategic priority blueprint, we're also, of course, working with Bonnie Landry um, and so we'll inform that to the best of the ability through this process and then continue to be available as you use. Um, so again, with respect to capital projects, um, what are the types of things that are on deck, if you will? Well, septic to sewer, of course, was a, um, was a big part of the conversation today. Um, uh, it is a costly venture that has significant um, social and environmental benefits, if you will, if you talk about some of those things. Um, that septic to sewer um, activity can either take place independently, which is a way that's going to, which, which will identify one of the um, one of the key flaws we try to avoid in local government project implementation. The first road that is torn up is sometimes the road that was just improved a uh, year before. We try to avoid that, of course, in, in every instance that we can. Um, and so, the septic to sewer projects can take place independently, or they can take place with roadway construction. Um, the, next, uh, the next set of projects that are identified um, based on your discussion so far, look at South Sewell's Point Road. Uh, there is uh, a strike while the iron's hot opportunity because um, um, water quality improvements are so prioritized by the legislature right now and the state's administration. Um, so the best time to get those dollars are when your project is popular with the agencies that have an opportunity to fund your projects. Um, and so uh, septic to sewer and South Sewell Point Road are kind of one set of projects, if you will. Um, you also have a variety of water quality improvements <coughs> and stormwater improvements uh, in the form of bath boxes and, um, and stormwater treatment areas. Um, and so 
Uh, those improvements um, uh, are identified with the South Sewell's Point Road project as well as on the northern side of Sewell's Point. Um, Sewell's Point Road itself, of course, um, has a road raising need. Uh, it's a county road. There, that project seems as though it's slated to occur uh, in the near term as well. <coughs> um, but it probably doesn't have the same timing as South Sewell's Point Road given the, uh, given the opportunity to, uh, to address the septic sewer challenges that exist. There is um, uh, the vacuum wastewater collection system that's been discussed as well. That's a single, uh, a, a single capital project um, that they can give you a partner opportunity, opportunity with the county. Um, Seawall replacement um, is another activity um, that is um, identified in your uh, kind of the realm of funding. Uh, bridge replacement, particularly at Island Road. Um, um, and then there's an undergrounding utilities opportunity um, that's going to take a long-term conversation with that PL. Uh, there is um, there is only benefit to getting to underground utilities if you're underground in all the utilities. So you know, usually starts a conversation with a local government at a certain number. And then the reality of what the number really is is revealed as you understand the project, the conflicts that exist with some of your existing infrastructure, and then the needs to underground all the other utilities, by the way, that usually aren't included in anything else estimate. So our understanding is that's probably in a ballpark of about a $15 million number. That's a big number. That's a resiliency opportunity. Um, um, again, the type of improvement that is um, that is better to consider if you're carrying the road up anyway. Uh, you might want to have um, you might want to have all the things that go underground go underground at the same time. So when the road then is back in place, um, you don't have a need to take it up again. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, there is a, an opportunity to um, to expand the gas line to town hall, um, and so that is a uh, that is a project that um, uh, again introduces more resiliency for the, for the town. Um, there are emergency access needs on South River Road. Um, there are waterfront access opportunities that get more into a quality of life um, aspect of sustainability. Um, and so, um, luckily, there are grant dollars to supplement those types of things because it's a very public access to a natural resource. Um, and the town is um, um, is, a, is a place where you have uh, lots of different um, age demographics. And so, if you want um, to have a, a sustainable a sustainable set of recreational opportunities, fishing and boardwalks, create those access points that make for helpless places that and you all know that so I'm walking through the capital projects. Um, there's an opportunity for a multi-use path to be constructed along the along South Sewell Point Road. Um, there are uh, grant dollars also to supplement that um, as part of the roadway reconstruction um, and uh, 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 and uh, the signage that goes along with that uh, to create a trail network for the town. Um, and then finally, there's the hardening of town hall and the resiliency improvement. Um, so these are the kinds of capital projects that have been identified for us thus far. Uh, I'm drinking from a fire hose, mm -hmm. getting from uh, 10 days ago when we really got into the project in today's presentation to understand what the type of projects are that you've identified thus far. And if um, I may, Madam Mayor. I would add to the discussion that we started having about mitigating the trees on South Sewell's Point Road with FPNL, them giving an option to underground just that portion in an effort to be able to regrow those trees correctly or to mitigate the trees in a different way. That would be an addition that we could make to the CIP project list. Okay. And, and, um, and thank you, Michelle. My apologies in that I had that in my notes and I didn't add it to your table, but I did actually recall that we had that conversation, which is beautification improvement, right? Um, which is a quality of life uh, enhancement. But again, if you're going to take the road up, you really, I think, want to do all that you need to before you put the road up. So, and I'll add um, uh, that landscaping to my list as well. So there's a lot to do. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Next slide. Uh, some examples of those types of projects. And today's conversation isn't to get into um, a budgeted um, prioritization of capital projects. We're well early in that process. But it's just to get input from you about what you think are the most important projects you'd like to see the town tackle so that we can then advance that conversation and work with Joe and, um, and Michelle to figure out what those things cost, how do we get a line for grant dollars in a, in a manner that um, brings you the best yield, um, and then bring back a more fine-tuned uh, list of projects to consider. So. Again, staying at a high level, <coughs> pardon me, um, uh, the types of stormwater quality improvements that are already envisioned um, along South Sewell's Point Road, for example, and that you've seen constructed in other parts of the town, 
um, stormwater treatment areas, uh, exfiltration, baffle boxes. Um, those are industry best practices. Grant agencies love to fund those things. Um, if you line them up well, um, you can get a two to or three to one match for your dollars um, because there are federal agencies that like to match state dollars uh, to produce these types of outcomes. Um, and so, um, and so uh, stormwater treatment improvements, of course, one category. Um, go ahead, next slide. Um, there's a need to do some land acquisition uh, to make those projects happen. Um, as you think about securing grant dollars for the town, uh, of the things that we've learned um, about being competitive for grant dollars is you really want to have your side of the table resolved before you get into the process. So that means a funding source that's set in place, land acquisition already done, um, and design, engineering, and permitting completed if you can. Um, if you can be shovel ready going into a grant acquisition process, you'll rank higher, you'll get a higher award, and you'll have a better chance to use that and get a second grant in a short period of time. Um, and so land acquisition um, is one of the activities that, um, that I know that you talked about as a community, but that's kind of a separate capital investment um, that again gets you positioned um, to, to bring more dollars in uh, to partner with your dollars um, in, in the grant acquisition process. Next slide. Uh, with respect to South Schools Point Road, um, I'm just kind of walking through some of the background that I know you've already um, had a chance to talk through, but I need to do that as part of my education to be able to help you through this conversation. So um, certainly there are, there's a host of resiliency improvements on South Schools Point Road. There are really different phases. This map illustrates phases one through four. Um, each of those phases um, uh, has um, um, has a different set of um, ancillary opportunities. Uh, phase one underway now, of course, but the next one um, with, um, I think, a lesson perhaps for the town in the grant acquisition process, um, as I understand it, and Joe can kind of chime in, um, but as I understand it, as um, the grant application we reviewed for this project, uh, the lack of um, local funding to supplement the uh, grant dollars brought your match down, and because your match wasn't high enough, you fell just out of um, the funding range from the um, Indian River Region of the Council? South uh, Florida Water Management. Water Management, yeah. Sorry. I have a, 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 a I'm trying to keep the pieces. All the acronyms. <laughs> Pardon? All the acronyms. All the, there. Uh, the, uh, I have an 11 page acronym list in the office. <laughs> 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 it's single space. It's single space. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but that said, you know, a lesson learned from this project, right? It's an excellent project, um, but uh, for it to be uh, the most economically um, uh, uh, advantageous to you, having a couple more dollars in to represent the skin in the game gets you positioned ahead of, frankly, the competing entities that you have. All the local governments are your partners, but in the grant application process, they're really they're your competitors. So just like every investment you make in a private sector activity, that front end investment, again, has their convenience. So, uh, so again, yeah, so the phase one project, which um, which is in motion now, um, phase two, I think is sliding a little bit behind, as I understand it. Phase three, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, so phases one, two, and three uh, down to Point Road, uh, and then collectively, uh, I'm sorry, Cheryl, if you can go ahead, Heather, yeah, Heather, Heather, advancing, Heather, go ahead and click forward. Okay. So those uh, those projects together, again, with the stormwater quality improvements that you can make at the same time, uh, a way to um, spend your dollars three times, right? So you get money from the water management district um, to, do, uh, uh, to do water quality improvements. You get money from FEMA to raise the road. Um, you have the opportunity to bring in um, MPO dollars to do multi-use paths. So those are all ways that you can leverage those grants, one against the other against the other, um, to, uh, to spend your dollars in the most effective way um, and efficiently you can. Go ahead, next slide. North Schools Point uh, septic to sewer conversion um, another substantial project um, that um, that has an opportunity to, to partner with the county. Next slide. Um, and again, another um, image of the improvements that are on North Schools Point Road, um, with road raising being the, uh, the piece of that project that is on the Next slide. Uh, vacuum system. Of course, you had a presentation this morning on the vacuum system. Um, uh, my sincere compliments to the manager because in um, in doing the due diligence that I needed to be ready for today's, um, today's presentation, uh, there has been an accelerated set of conversations with the county, um, and I think it's been very productive for the town, uh, because 
Um, there is an adage that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So if you're not out asking for some partnership and consideration, certainly there's other priorities that the county has to address. Uh, but because there was a need to start to really fine tune um, the, um, the understanding of how can the county be your partner accepting sewer um, uh, opportunities, um, I think the town is much better positioned to advance in our local agreement um, and try to um, and try to uh, use the county's um, depth and resources um, to get design in place for you to be um, moving more quickly with the um, with the septic sewer uh, project on South Sewers Point Road. Um, so there's um, uh, Sam, of course, was here this morning. Um, I think what we've learned in about 10 days of dialogue with the county, and Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that. Yes, there are opportunities for the county to assist you. Um, there are examples the county can draw from and looking at other projects that it's pursued. Um, uh, even though your improvements weren't prioritized as highly um, as other improvements, uh, as other locations in the county, uh, there, is, um, there is already a funding relationship, a funding um, mechanism the county has in place um, that you can piggyback on um, and, and utilize if you want to um, to accelerate the improvements um, in, in the town. I think there's a continuing conversation about how much design assistance the county can provide, um, but it sounds like more than zero, which is a good thing, because when we began the conversation, it didn't seem as though there was an opportunity for the county, for the county to assist you with design. Uh, but maybe we've learned a bit more, um, and, uh, um, and, and the county certainly seems to be a very interested partner in helping the county advance um, uh, any subject to your improvements. There's a series of um, mobility improvements. So I would suggest that you're more on the quality of life, um, uh, part of sustainability, um, that can be implemented over time. Um, so this map um, illustrates uh, some of those locations. Uh, you have a number of stormwater treatment facilities uh, that exist along the edge of the river. Um, the way to make those interesting usually for residents is to connect them. Um, and so uh, the idea of making some type of resiliency trail, that might not be the right name, uh, but the concept is there. Um, you have incredible resources in the town um, with uh, Sandra Thurlow um, and others who really know the history of the community. So once you have um, a piece of land that moves into um, public ownership or the reason for being there, you have an opportunity to do lots of different things with it, not just being a stormwater going into the river, but tell the story of why, how the river is there and the relationship between the land and the river um, and the history of the town make it interesting for people. Um, it doesn't take a lot of square footage to put in a bench and a couple of trees, so now you have a public access point um, that gives you a little bit of relief. And then with a fairly low cost investment, you can connect those places one to another um, and create really a new experience um, to celebrate, frankly, the leadership that you take on in cleaning up some water before it heads, uh, heads into the room. Um, and so uh, in addition to that, uh, there's some other public access opportunities that have been talked about over time. I think the last time I was in Town Hall, I was presenting the waterways plan for Martin and St. Louis counties, and one of the ideas that came about uh, was a series of uh, public um, public uh, water taxi docks um, in different locations in, in Martin County. Um, some of those are being installed now. Two of the locations were right on the either side of um, what is really downtown Sewell's Point, but that's an opportunity as well. Again, grant dollars available to assist in Constructing those types of things if that's a design. Um, next slide. A uh, couple of images uh, just of the types of things we've talked about uh, public docks um, for fishing or just for drawing the water. Uh, maybe there are some opportunities for that, particularly on the southern end. Um, the idea of interconnecting um, your destination with a walking trail, um, the signage that lets you know you're kind of along the way on your journey. Um, Seawall improvements, of course, um, we've touched on as a resiliency and a way to maintain property values. Next slide. Just simply creating opportunities to enjoy the water um, at public, uh, public access points that you have, um, uh, uh, water taxi docks, or, or uh, any other type of public dock if that's desired, um, and what we use paths to connect them to the point. Um, and then next slide. So uh, if I could spend, um, and, and by the way, any questions, please jump in. Um, but uh, bringing us to a point where we'll have just a kind of a more structured conversation, but I'm just trying to kind of give you some overview. Mayor? 
Um, there was a question earlier from Commissioner Fender. I don't know if there you felt in. Okay. Okay. Gonna... Then keep going on. We'll probably save most of them for the end. Thank you. Um, so with respect to Mark's system, Sam already had a chance to talk about the differences between the binder system and the vacuum system. Um, it seems fairly evident that the vacuum system is um, the appropriate for the size and scale. I'm telling schools my road. Go ahead, next one. Um, so what we know, of course, is the county has, um, has done um, a uh, pretty extensive job of mapping all the locations of the county where those improvements uh, are, uh, are slated to happen. Uh, Sewell's Point is on that list, but it's on that list at a point in time that seems to be 10 to maybe 12 or 13 years in the future based on available funding um, and priorities. Um, and so every capital projects conversation is a balance of as a balance of priorities. If you want to accelerate that investment, it's going to probably take a concerted effort on the side of the town to move that schedule forward. It doesn't seem as those dollars are going to fall on the county from another source um, to really accelerate that. Um, and so this slide illustrates um, those mass projects um, in Martin County. You can see um, Sewell's Point, South Sewell's Point identified in the pink there. Um, that's beyond the five year time frame based on our conversation thus far. It seems as though it's beyond the 10 year time frame, realistically. Um, and so that'll be well beyond, um, I think, the schedule that you're envisioning for the road rate aspect of that project, uh, which is um, which is one of the that creates opportunity. Um, as you, uh, next slide, Heather. Um, so again, this, uh, um, this little legend from that map um, illustrates uh, the order of projects for the next five years. Um, Sewell's Point is not on this next five year list. Go ahead, next slide. Um, but instead identified um, as outside the five years, which, uh, which opens the door for that conversation. Next slide. Now, with respect to potential funding sources, again, the town has been, um, I think, um, very successful on a per capita basis, a nature basis, in bringing grant dollars in from other entities. Um, so this slide just illustrates the types of entities that I think are the ones that you would want to pursue based on those capital projects that um, that have been introduced into, the, into conversation so far. So the town is certainly one of the money sources, so let's never forget that. Sometimes we forget to put the cow logo when we have grant funding conversations, but no. Um, the town and county are both funding sources. They never lived in council, uh, DP, um, the uh, Department of Emergency Management, uh, the state of Florida through legislative appropriations. Uh, fine if you want to pursue those types of public access projects, like Loading docks or public access points, uh, fishing piers, um, uh, boardwalks, um, defined as a 50 50 funding partner for the local governments. Uh, the water management district, of course, the town has a long history in bringing dollars down from, uh, uh, from South Florida uh, water management. FEMA, and then I, uh, and I want to have included more MPO um, if the conversation um, is, uh, is to include multi use paths, um, because that's a, um, uh, that's a standard MPO activity. So with respect to these types of funding entities, um, as you consider how these things um, correlate to one another, most of the grant agencies are really matching um, as, a, as a rule of thumb. Many of them allow you to match one source of funds against another. So if you have federally sourced grant dollars, you typically match that against state sourced grant dollars. Um, and so that brings down your match requirement. What we have seen in helping local governments over time um, is that 50-50 matching really isn't enough anymore. So local government uh, needs for local governments to overmatch, um, which should get to 60 or 70 percent uh, in, uh, in matching, um, to really be competitive in the application process. Um, go ahead, next slide. Uh, so, there we go. Um, so how to compete for grant dollars, um, if that's a core part of your um, of your thinking in terms of your strategic blueprint, um, I just kind of summarize the things that we've seen as successful when we look at local governments. Have local dollars in hand and be prepared to open match. Those are the most successful local governments we see. Um, you can do that in a number of ways. You can have a part of your budget that's just a local annual budget allocation. Um, but it's really, we find local governments to be much more successful when they have a dedicated funding source because they can point to that. Um, and um, it's not as uh, it's not as uh, uh, variable on an annual budget basis. Once it's a dedicated funding source, it's a lot easier to go to a water management district and say, look, we have a dedicated funding source that's generating uh, half a million dollars a year, so in five years, you know, one and a half million dollars, we can do that on average, um, and you can count on us for that, instead of 
next year's budget cycle and have a conversation about whether or not we'll put um, that half a million dollars in from our, from our uh, annual budget. Um, our annual budget. Um, the other thing that, uh, that helps is to have other things in hand. So sometimes when you're looking for grant dollars, um, you can get positioned to, um, to commit as much as you need to to get the first grant in hand. And once you have that grant in hand, you can do that to match the second grant and actually start to reduce the amount of commitment you have because that second grant makes up for what you committed to do. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, we recently worked with a community in Palm Beach County uh, that had never done a really never done a multi-year budget. Uh, it was a very interesting process, a small special district actually, that their annual budget conversation uh, happens to focus on paving roadways. It's a community with a lot of roadway paving. And it hadn't really been successful in grant funding as a result. It got passed over um, often because it didn't have the ability to have a long-term forecast. So through a conversation with that community, they now have a 20-year capital program. They had never talked about long-term budgeting. We provided a $20 million, 15-year program. Um, and they allowed us to go ahead and illustrate that it was about an $83 million program over time. So it's a heavy conversation to have for a community. But now that they're able to have a long-term conversation, they're going to be in the grant funding pipeline every year for multiple grants because they have a forecast of where they're going. Um, and they're having the local funding, um, uh, dedicated funding source conversation to be sure that they're competitive. So there's two pieces of that equation. Being able to step back, zoom out, and look down 10 years or longer uh, to have a realistic expectation about um, uh, the larger projects. Some, some communities have a lot of challenge with that, but if you can get past that conversation, um, and allow yourself to have a conversation about the funding necessary to get there, the reward to the local governments is, again, much greater return on grant applications. The second thing to consider is being shovel ready and strike when the iron is hot. So if you can get your project positioned, so land acquisition is done, easements are in hand, um, uh, design, engineering, and permitting is complete, well, we're getting ready to head into some type of production at a federal level, and the result to a correction is always a, is always a tranche of stimulus funding that comes. The green stimulus, or rebuild America, or building America better, whatever the funding source coming, there's a funding source that's coming. It's probably about 12 to 18 months out when those dollars will really start to arrive. What we know in the ARA stimulus, as the most recent example, projects that really weren't necessarily the best projects got funded because they were struggle ready and the local governments had already gotten them in line. Um, so even though some of the agencies even looked at those projects and acknowledged there might have been a greater need in a different location, they just couldn't push the dollars down. They have to push dollars down to get projects built. So being shovel ready is one piece of that, which is a front end investment. And then being able to strike when the iron is hot. Water quality is a popular topic right now at the um, at the state level. That's very advantageous for a town that needs water quality improvements. So lining those projects up um, is, um, is opportunistic. Um, so we would suggest um, that correlates well with what the town's needs are. Uh, the other um, piece of being successful in grant funding, of course, is building and, and maintaining solid community support. And the town has done a really great job of engaging its partners at all the different levels you have a standard set of relationships when you go into the grant application process. You already have letter, letters of support um, in the, um, on the letterhead of other entities. The other thing to suggest to you, to the best of your ability, is to get your projects adopted in other agencies' plans. That's the other way to really be competitive. Because then it's not just your comp plan saying, we need this improvement. But it's Warren County, or the Water Management District, or the EP saying, we need this project in this location. So that way, um, you really can accelerate um, your success rate. Um, and so using partners at all the different levels, getting embedded in things like the local management strategy, right? You've already got your project in LMS, that's key. You can't even get in the door if you're not in LMS. Now you're in the LMS, so you have that opportunity. Martin County provides another opportunity to you for your projects to become embedded in the documents of another local government partner. Um, and the other piece of that, of course, is having organized and consistent messaging. So it's always louder when you hear the same thing from 100 voices instead of 100 different ideas from 100 voices. It doesn't really 
advance you. Um, and so taking a leadership role and organizing the message uh, and then being consistent in that as if you distribute it to other entities, um, we think we, we tend to see local governments to do that. So some ideas about how to think. So it's, um, uh, it is, um, and compete is there by accident. So um, uh, it is a competitive process. Uh, with respect to my uh, questions, or can I go ahead and keep going? Uh, keep rolling. Um, with respect to <clears throat> pardon me, uh, infrastructure financing, uh, you of course have two different paths. You can pay as you go on an annual budget appropriation basis. Um, it is um, sometimes um, easier politically to do that, um, but it doesn't give you the same strength um, in, um, uh, in uh, financing larger projects and bringing dollars in from uh, other entities to do that. So, you have a pay-as-you-go opportunity, or where you have some type of longer-term debt financing. Um, uh, both options open to you, but count as you utilize both as well. Um, uh, go ahead, next slide. Uh, NSTUs, of course, are a very popular and effective mechanism in Martin County. Martin County already has a structure in place to do things like utilize roadway, um, uh, roadway and stormwater NST dollars to pay for, um, pay for uh, the connected program so that structure exists if the town wants to pursue it it's pretty efficient and it's already been tested and defended so it's an option that you have uh, to utilize if you think that's appropriate okay, next slide. stormwater utilities are another mechanism um, that are very popular especially in florida this map illustrates where uh, stormwater utilities are located on, on the county basis um, <clears throat> uh, stormwater utilities provide you um, a dedicated funding source both for capital and maintenance um, and the reason I included this one because you have know, maintenance obligations that will continue over time. Um, it is, um, um, it is uh, also a mechanism that grant agencies like to see because when you have a stormwater utility, that utility requires um, a stormwater utility master plan that's a very thoughtful and carefully analyzed um, set of, uh, set of uh, evaluations regarding what your stormwater needs are and a long-term approach um, to mitigate those impacts. Um, and so it doesn't just give you a financing mechanism, it gives you a good organizational document that again makes you more competitive when you pursue grant dollars for, um, for um, stormwater projects. You also can get other agencies to participate with you more effectively when you have a stormwater utility. This is what we want, um, so particularly with roadway projects. Um, next slide, bonds. Of course, bonding also an opportunity um, if you need it. Um, it might not be necessary, uh, but it's one of those mechanisms that's out there. Um, I, I included it just to kind of um, carry out the example that I was using for that small special district that we helped in Palm Beach County. Um, they only have bonding really as a mechanism to use. So because they're having that conversation now, they're able to hopefully get to the other side of that and have a $5 million tranche they can use to then start to go and out-compete others to get in line for grant dollars that they can't get otherwise. Um, and so each local government is balanced in its own way. Again, it's an option that you have as a community. Um, and so, so with that, um, uh, a couple of, uh, I'll take a breath, uh, and, uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to walk through at a very high level um, the idea of, um, of capital projects prioritization. Um, so I have two setup slides. I'm going to ask. Um, uh, it's going to be uh, April. Cheryl. 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 <laughs> April is here. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, so names and faces. Eventually, I'll get them straight. So I promise. You. So Cheryl's going to give me a hand and describe it um, while we walk through that conversation. Um, and so there's really two categories of things that I'd like to get feedback from you about. One of them is how the pri what are the priorities that you see uh, for your town? What are the most important things? That we should address first. Um, that's one part of the conversation. The other part of the conversation is about strategies. So what are the strategies that you think are the ones that are the best fit for you? And that really relates to financing. So because you have excellent engineering, you have excellent management, um, and you have partnerships available to you. So I think the other piece of strategy that's outstanding is, well, how do you want to start to amass the work that you need to go get your projects funded. So I think that's probably the focus, but it's not my conversation, it's your conversation. So um, so starting with priorities, um, uh, if you can shed some light on um, 
Uh, we lay out uh, a number of different project categories. You have, you have environmental projects, uh, septic to sewer, stormwater quality. Um, you have resiliency projects, raising the road, burying the lines. Um, you have mobility projects, which are things like multi-use trails, access to the water. Um, and then you have what I think I would call quality of life projects. Beautification with tree canopies, for example. Um, perfect. So, um, so with that, okay. uh, please, uh, uh, please teach me what are the priorities for uh, for. Thank you, Kim, for such a wonderful presentation. I'll just have the other commissioners press the buttons, and then I will call on them, and they can answer whatever. So you're in charge. I'm just pressing buttons. <laughs> Commissioner Fender. I am happy to start. First, thank you for that overview, Kim, I, and kudos to whoever got Kim involved in this process. Thank you. That was awesome. Uh, and first, I'll just say what resonated with me early on in your, your presentation was the, the comment that I, I haven't heard put just that way before, and I'll probably get it wrong, but... Uh, uh, regarding uh, septic to sewer, you said there's no evidence showing that septic systems are, are good for the environment. There are only studies that show the various levels of how bad they might be. So I've never used it quite that way, but I'm going to steal that, and uh, I like I that. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so um, uh, I don't know if you received, but I brought, because we did sort of a, a prioritization effort last year around this time and uh, so I, I printed 10 of them this morning early and shared them at least up here I don't know if you're if Bonnie and you guys got one uh, selfishly I put my list on the top but <laughs> more, you're probably more interested in the second page which is the, the what I think we were in it off last year with all of the commissioners prioritizations sort of aggregated and bubbled up to what what we all thought were high um, and so if you use it for what it's worth and ignore it for what it's not worth. But your process is awesome, and let's do what... Uh, do you have that? I mayor, do, yes. Mayor. In fact, the manager forwarded to me as well as the latest one. I think it's not okay. Least, uh, 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 so uh, I also liked uh, what you put on your slide as the resiliency trail. And, uh, and one of the highest priorities uh, for myself, and it looked like aggregated high with, with the others as well, is you know protection of our property values and personally i think our property values are, are protected and continue to increase by the protection of our environmental stewardship but also uh building things like this uh, resiliency trail and also enhancing the amount of waterfront property that's available to all uh, tax-paying citizens in the community so uh, you know if, if a person's going to come in and invest in our property and drive the property up they're, they're going to be attracted by a, a, a small, beautiful community like ours that also gives them the ability to walk their dog out their door and walk down and watch the sunrise or sunset near the beach, not only at the playground, but, you know, before every single bit of square inch of the peninsula is built up where you can't access private property, right? So uh, there are still a few properties around that uh, might be accessible to uh, allowing the, the town to... Uh, make additional parks and green space so uh, you know those are things that we might want to identify and, and keep on our burner and uh, what else was I was gonna say getting our strategic properties in plan oh and, and also at the end when you were talking about uh, strategic initiatives that allow us to be more successful uh, the idea of getting our strategic initiatives on the project plans of other municipalities as well so we can so our goals become their goals. That's a that's a brilliant idea, and we I, I assume we're doing some of that. But that's a great thing that we should keep keep on our in our focus. Anyway, that's just uh, my you know I've I've already got my parties delivered to you. Some of my notice are checked off. Playground is done, and so that's awesome. But um, for what it's worth, I'll just keep participating and follow your and the mayor's lead. Great job, and thank you for your involvement. And it's on. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other commissioners at this point, so I'm going to say, um, you know, doing the exercise last year was very helpful. I'm glad we did that. Um, you know, and you're subjected to weighing it at that particular time, and, you know, your, I don't want to say your views change or they don't change, but at this point in time, um, my main priorities and I think what is best for the town and the residents are infrastructure, the road raising, and 
potential sewer in South Souls Point, the stormwater. I, I think those are, you know, once we get the town gets that under control, then it, to me it makes a little more sense to then follow with the um, the trails, the the more fun stuff. Not that that's not important because that's what fills people with joy, which is important. Um, but that's my priorities at the moment are the raising of the road and the and and procuring money. I really appreciated the whole. Um, and that how to compete for grant dollar dollars that was an excellent slide because we talk a lot about grants that's kind of how the town gets its money for a lot of the projects and I find it very confusing and you know trying to understand the role it plays in the town so I appreciate that slide very much sure. um, it's tricky I mean the grant process is tricky and it gets very frustrating yeah so because you have a lot you're a town that has a lot of really solid community support. so everyone is behind that, that project so so, so again, if we get into the, the strategies conversation, um, it takes money to make money. Yes, right? that's, in, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> There's nothing in life that doesn't take money to make money. So it's really, it's, it's hard to make the second dollar when you start with one, but it's easier to make the second million dollars when you start with the first million dollars. Very true. So, so getting that word chest is, um, is going to be advantageous. Okay, and then, uh, Commissioner Tom Peck. Thank you. Yeah, this is kind of my first uh, foray into this, and uh, I did fill out some forms for uh, town manager during the week, but I certainly agree that, um, you know, we have a lot of great ideas for some of the things we want to do, and trying to match that to uh, what's available in the budget is, is almost impossible until we, at least until I think we work out some kind of, a, of an overall plan. When you look at our budget for uh, this year, we have very little money in it for capital improvement projects and most of these things would certainly be identified as capital improvement projects. So I don't know how we get from A to B here. When we talk about all these items and they're all, they're all fabulous ideas, don't get me wrong. But I don't know how we get there with our current budget or future budgets. Commissioner, it's not going off. Commissioner Campo. Yes. Uh, well, thanks to Michelle for knowing that uh, sometimes you need an outside expert that uh, specializes in things like this. So, you know, that's a sign of a good leader is being able to build a team and know when you need a specialist. And uh, you don't get much more special than Kim Delaney. I've seen you give <laughs> presentations in eight different venues. And whatever you're selling, I'm always buying it by the end of the presentation, you know. I'm in it hard first. So. Yes. Um, I think whenever uh, you're elected and, you know, as you come into a community, you've got to get a feel for the community and you drop some names and, you know, we've got a lot of folks uh, uh, in Sewell's Point that are, I would call, influencers in the community. So you have to get a feel. And when you're an elected official, you also have to get a feel for who your community is. And, um, you know, I think it's important to know that this community is um, largely a conservative group. It's three to one Republican, as an example. Uh, we've had the same tax millage rate for five years. Um, at the same time, I think we have a lot of professionals and entrepreneurs who are um, willing to spend money for something that is explained to them properly and as they say in sales you create the need before you just hand them the bill and uh, as joe capper taught me early on in any of these projects there's three legs to the stool there's the design there's the money and there's making the case and i think this is a great first step uh, or continuation of what we've done with the strategic plans to, to make the case for the capital improvements. I think if we went to the residents with the well-crafted design uh, and uh, it, it gave them uh, a plausible explanation that um, it's, it's a tricky thing. It is the chicken and the egg. It's, it's kind of like building the airplane as you're flying it. And you get nailed if you don't have every answer and you're trying to, someone said, Sam said you have to have a little faith, you know. When you're spending $2 million of soft cost before even, you know, in order to get shovel ready, you've got to spend a lot of money. 
you know, and you have nothing to show for it. So it's, it's a difficult thing. But my, my point is that if we could make a case for the capital improvements, because no one wants to pay for another town employee or a county employee or federal employee. They just, they want to see some tangible benefit. I think then we could increase the tax millage rate. I think we could do debt. I think we could create, you know, a new funding source. But it all starts with creating that case and showing we've been good stewards with the money that we've been entrusted to. And going to the septic to sewer, I think now that we've done, you know, up to 200 ERC's capacity to convert, and again, the boogeyman didn't show up. We didn't cut down trees and, you know, rape and pilfer the whole town. I think we've got some experience. And when we do the project, um, when we complete the project that we're doing now, we've got another proven, you know, people want to see that it's not just to pay for fancy, you know, town hall stuff. It's for tangible goods. So I, I would be willing to look at debt. I would be willing to look at increasing the millage rate, but it's going to have to be a well-crafted uh, with a lot of buy-in. And if it does require debt, uh, the only way I would go with debt is if we had a, uh, like a, a town referendum. And that's the way the bonds are normally floated. I think we're too small to do a bond, but I think we could get a tax preferred uh, lend, uh, lending from a, a bank that specializes in municipalities. But I would be open to debt if it's capital uh, backed because you're just trading one asset for the other asset. To just float around and say, hey, let's have a, a line of credit just in case, you know, there's uh, the, the next bright, bright, shiny object to chase, I'm not for that. But if we had a cohesive plan uh, and it, it, if it involved debt, I would be willing to go along with, and even one of the probably most conservative members of the community, uh, Mrs. Chantos, said, if the town votes for this with a, with a referendum, I would back it. That's a pretty strong thing to say. So the debt part of it, I would be open to but um, it's something that I think we should do a referendum. If we did, if the, if the septic to sewer is 16 million, I think you said 15.8, divided by 650, that's a cost of $24,307. If you were to say to me, are you in favor of that right now? I would say no. I would say absolutely not. If you said, hey, the county's gonna give you the first 13 million, Okay, that's another story, but they're not saying that. They're just coming up with imaginary scenarios. Um, we have to come up with that money. We have to have a constant administration to administration, mayor to mayor. We have to have a constant grant pipeline, you know, constantly. Everyone who's the mayor should be working something in Tallahassee every year because it's three years until you actually benefit from that. So those are my comments on the financing, which is an important part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kurzman? Yes, I appreciate the presentation. Some very good points you brought up. Um, the major things, uh, would it sort of like to separate the luxuries, like burying power lines or bringing like parks, sidewalks or stuff on the side right now? That's a luxury right now at this point. Um, the other thing that really, as the infrastructure changes, so is our upkeep. And that's going to be another new expense, which is going to be much greater than what we currently have. So we also got to take that into consideration, which is automatically going to have to raise taxes. There's no way possible. Can you add all this and expect all these outfalls? They're not going to clean themselves. And everything we're doing, when you bring in one thing, you're going to need more to keep that thing up, whatever that thing might be. Um, so that's going to be part of the expenses. So we're not going to be able to maintain what we have as far as um, with our current um, tax structure that we have. Uh, but you know, I, I think we really need to concentrate pretty much on the priorities to get the necessities in first, which is keeping our town from flooding, 
keeping the rivers clean at the same time. We're doing two things at once by doing this. And one of the things also is capturing water more so up on the riverfront properties, on the St. Lucie riverfront properties, <coughs> the largest slots we have. And there's comments made to me personally. So I, you know, and it, it's not every lot, but the primary big lots are the ones that discharge most of the water because they're not capturing their share. And what's happening is the water is washing down the road to the lots that are further down, and that's how flooding is created. But it starts on the top, and those are your biggest lots, and there's really nothing in here addressing those directly, and I think that's a major part. When you address that, you're going to take handle the flooding at the same time. And you really have to start at the top of the hill and go from there, and that will help us save money in the long run, and will alleviate a lot of the pain that we're suffering as you go further east into the town. Um, but once again, I'm just going to say upkeep is the major part. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Um, Commissioner Fender. Uh, I was just going to uh, piggyback on some of uh, Commissioner Campo's comments, and that uh, just uh, with some personal history, I moved here 18 years ago from Delray Beach, and I, I purchased a property in Delray Beach, which uh, quadrupled in value. Uh, mainly because when I moved there, people thought I was crazy. And then, uh, and while I was there, they won the All American City Award twice, you know, which is rare to win it once, they won it twice. Um, and some of the things they did, which kind of uh, struck me from your comments, James, is that, that uh, the vision, I think you used, you make the case, you know, what they did was had a very clear vision. And uh, like one of the things they did is built a, I don't know how many millions of dollars, but it was a public library. And there was not tax dollars to support a public library, but they wanted a public library and it was good for the town. And some leader, who I wasn't involved in the politics of it, said, we're, you know, we're, we're gonna make it happen. And so they, they painted a picture somehow to the community that said, we wanna build a library. It's gonna be good for the community. Here's a picture of what it's gonna look like. And, uh, and they put it on the vote for a referendum to to say, will you raise your tax dollars, X dollars, to build the public library? I voted yes, and it passed, of course, with a, I don't know what percentage, but they did it more than once, right? So that when they wanted something that was good for the community that was gonna increase the, the property value of the overall community, they took it to referendum, and they, but they made sure that people knew what, they were, what it was that they were voting on. And they have a, a, a theme for their entire town, it's called Village by the Sea. So everything's tied back to the theme of the town, Village by the Sea. And uh, so this resiliency trail concept that you brought up, you know, a, a vision of, of how the town will look 10 or 20 years from now based on whatever this concept is that you're, you may or may not vote on. Uh, I think you're building the case is a, an important part of what you stated, James. So I think a really crisp vision of, of what life will be like if you make this investment in the future is what's going to win the day with the, the Shantosis and the, the conservative voters of the community that you raised. And it needs to be beneficial to all of us. And I, I think some of the things you brought up in your presentation are beneficial to all of us and, and do increase the, the value of our town. So I could get behind that if, if there was a clear enough graphical vision. I'm a graphical person, so I mean, it, I'd like to see it rather than talk about it, right? And it can't just be an obtuse number. It has to be a, a number tied to the plan of this is what we are going to create. We are going to raise the road two feet and it's going to cost X and this is what it's going to look like when it's done. Will you vote on it? Right, so. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, town Manager. Hope you don't mind. This, uh, th this is supposed to be interactive. So, I mean, okay. I think it's, I, I love hearing all this and it's fun. And I think also we should use it as an opportunity to brainstorm and ideate, right? So that way if, if Kim hears something that spark something, she can kind of do some additional conversations as well. So when I was speaking with Kim earlier in the week, one of the things that she was referring to constantly, and I wrote it down, was um, her, she mentioned it, she calls it generating matching dollars. <coughs> How are we going to generate the matching dollars? So everybody really wants to talk about the culture that we have, and many other towns wish they had our culture, which is grant-centric. With the grant-centric culture 
we always have a column when you take a look at those tables that says town and that's the town responsibility. We don't often talk about when that's uh, going to be needed, meaning when is that bill coming to roost and how that kind of accumulates over time and how we're going to pay for that town responsibility portion when to uh, Commissioner Tom Pick's point, if you take a look at our budget, we don't anticipate raising it in any way to be able to pay for that portion. So we can sit here and say what our priorities are and what our best projects are, but we really do need these types of conversations to be frank with each other to figure out how are we going to pay for this and, and come up with the ways to make it happen. And so I hear you when you say it's a great idea to go out to referendum and see what the people think, but I will remind you that you are elected to represent the voice of the people. And when people elect you, it's because they trust you to think about what their best options are and the long-term uh, commitments that you need to make for the town. And you know more about what's going on in the town than most of the 2,000 plus voters in the town. So, so just as a reminder, okay. when we're calling out one or two people's residents' names on the dais, and we're, I just want to balance that with understanding there's at least 2,000 others that are counting on you to make a good choice for them, right? Okay, so when you're uh, going through your process, I wrote down, I had a question. I was wondering what you see, each one of you, as the best amenity or value add to the town right now. Like when you talk about the town and you're proud, what are the things you say to your friends, to your family? You want answers? Yeah, okay. Just to throw it out there. Um, I, public safety, the police department, and the natural beauty in the environment are probably the top two. With two elections I've had recently, those are the things people consistently praise and are pleased with. Sorry, Commissioner Bender. Um, I would agree with that, and I would say when people ask me where I live, and a lot of people don't know where Sewell's Point is, I always use the term peninsula. Uh, waterfront and public safety. So, any other commissioner? Commissioner Kurzman. Yeah, the thing that really grabs me is like, especially when I come back to my office in Fort Lauderdale, when I cross over that bridge right mm -hmm. here, as I'm looking over, I see the water and I see this big, long peninsula that's just tree lined, and the boats in the water, and you come through and you make a right, you see the like old Florida, it's the best way I can describe it. It's old When you see the tree, the, the mature trees, mm -hmm. uh, it's, just, it, it's just, that's what attracted me to move here. When I came in, it wasn't like just grass lawns and a couple of palm trees. We're more than that. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes us special. We also have rules and regulations here. Where I come home, um, like if you walk out to Rocky Point or, um, North River Shore, or any of those areas, you'll see people sitting there with trailers, boats in their driveways, or on their lawns. Uh, you'll see people working on their cars. It's, to me, it's, it's like an eyesore. You don't get these eyesore here. You don't see cars on cinder blocks. Um, we do have rules here, and I'm glad we have these rules. That's what makes us Souls Point, not Rocky Point, not North River Shores, not Golden Gate, and it allows us to, you know, we require people to cut their grass, and definitely makes us, it's just very tactful here, and everything's orderly, it's neat, and it's home, it really is. You really, when you come here, you're glad you live here. Yes, I agree. Um, Commissioners Campo or Tompak, did you want to add to that? I didn't know if Michelle was going to take that to another place. We're, we're putting it. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And we're right. putting it on the. Excellent. I, I would just add, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but I think the residents themselves here are um, just, they're genteel. They're polite. They're, if you go on a stoplight and Sewell's Point versus go to Broward and the light turns green, let's say you're kind of, daydreaming <laughs> I measure I measure a person like behind me do they wait one second to beep or ten seconds to beep? 
And source points, sometimes they don't even beep because they figure, hey, maybe you got something on your mind, you know? And I, I, th I think of people like Laura D. Barrard, and I think of Margie Jordan, and I think of Knight Kiplinger and Sandra Thurlow, and uh, I just think it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's really an honor to, to be in the seat because of some of the people that, that live here. True. Thank you. Thank you. Beep delay. I put beep delay. Beep delay. Uh, to one. Beep delay. <laughs> beep delay. <laughs> that needs to be a stat. Commissioner Tom Peck, did you want to add anything? Are you good? Well, I think, um, you know, from a, a public perception, uh, you know, Seals Point is well known as a very, very safe place to live. And I think that's that's very attractive to uh, folks. They know if they come in South Seals Point, they're going to have to pass the police station coming in and also mm -hmm. going out. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, certainly a deterrent. And I think uh, people appreciate that. Uh, you know, the natural beauty is... Uh, is important to everybody here in maintaining that. And I think the, uh, to what uh, <coughs> Commissioner Kurzman just mentioned, uh, the code enforcement is very important to the, uh, you know, the beauty and the public safety of the, uh, the town. So I can't uh, add a whole lot more than that, but that's, I think those are three very important things. Yes, thank you. Um, Kim, can I ask you a, a question? I have some, I didn't know, you had started out saying asking priorities and then asking strategies. And I've been kind of thinking about the priorities. I had some questions about funding stuff, and I didn't know if you had an ideal way you wanted to structure the conversation or. May I just wrap this real quick? Maybe? Um, and, and Commissioner Fender wanted to say something, then I'll yeah. get to you. Okay. Did you have? Uh, I don't. It's not very important, but I was just going to mention on the, the beep delay. That's a real thing. I mean, when I used to, when I moved here 18 years ago, I used to tell people and my friends back in Delray, I'm like, you could sit through an entire light cycle and nobody would <laughs> beep at you. And then down south, they beep all the time, right? But it's a, it's a real thing. Yeah. That's true. You say in New York City, the shortest period of time is between when a red light turned green and the guy behind you beat. That's time. crazy. Um, town manager. So I, I wrote down a couple things. I wrote everything you said, and then I summarized it with uh, protecting the waters because mm -hmm. you believe in the beauty of the peninsula, and multiple people said that. You believe in protecting the people, protecting the waterfront and what's in it, and protecting the culture of the sense of community. And when I think about that, you know, we're, that's where we're at. Like, that's our reality. When, when people say, you know, embrace your reality before you start to m try to make some changes, that is where we're at. And I would say that that occurred not by accident, by design, by previous commissions, but I don't think it occurred by referendum. I think it occurs because the people that get elected in the town of Sewell's Point are more connected with the people because you do this for free. You're here because you want to be part of the public service and you do your homework to make sure you understand what the next hundred years holds. So I want you to move forward with confidence that you do represent the people and you understand the issues. And that's why you're elected to be able to do that. So I congratulate you on, on being able to recognize where you're at and also to recognize where we need to go. And so as we're moving forward to the next discussion, which is now how the heck do we pay for this stuff? Uh, it's a real, uh, it's a real tough conversation. It's a fierce conversation, and we need to understand the dynamics of everything and how we're going to get there. Okay, thank you, Town Manager. Um, and so now you're going to go into how to pay for the how to fund things, correct? Pitching back to me, sir. Thank yes. You. Thank and you for that insight. <laughs> and, um, and 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 it reinforces what I picked up from the strategy from the um, uh, the strategic initiatives, right? Environmental stewardship. Um, protection of your property values really comes from the, all of those, uh, those things. So I see those as iterative as I think about how the town protects and advances um, its destination quality. Um, with respect to strategies, as you start to think about strategies, and, and we'll do our best, so what we'll, have, we'll, we'll take that input and we'll come back to you after working with your team. I'm really part of your staff in this conversation. So as your staff coming back in April with a capital project budget, right? prioritize budget for your further discussion in terms of what those, what those dollars should be assigned. So how we get those dollars is the other part of the conversation, which is the strategy part. Mm -hmm. um, and um, is, I was listening very closely <coughs> to how you describe the community, sure. because um, as, as Michelle has suggested, um, you know, there's different types of leadership, right? There's a delegated form of leadership and a representative form of leadership. So, um, and in a delegated form of leadership, 
it's really hard to ever get any action to occur because you're always waiting for permission as a council, really, to make sure that that ground is okay to take. In a representative form, though, if you've been entrusted with that, uh, somebody has to shine the light and say, we're heading in this direction. Because if nobody ever shines the light in the direction, there is no direction. So, and you just kind of stay on and go, and you never get to advance. Uh, and it's, there's a reason a lot of people don't run for office. And it's because, as Sam mentioned earlier, there's a risk in having to make decisions without knowing everything. It's frustrating, and it's challenging, and it's uncomfortable. Um, and that's the seat that you volunteered yourselves for. So as a public agency staff member, thank goodness people volunteer themselves to sit in those chairs, because if no one is making the decisions, we never get anything to happen. The flip side of that is for us as your team to make you confident that you have enough information be able to say, okay, here's the direction we're going in, and this is how we're going to get there. And we endorse this as a direction. Everyone, do you agree with us? Instead of what do you think we want, we should do. So there's a real difference in how that path gets lit. Um, and so I just wanted to build on that comment that Michelle made, because it ties into one of the ideas that I'd like you to consider in strategy. And it builds on something that um, Vice Mayor Campo suggested. Um, about the entrepreneurialship amongst the residents of the town. Right? And the town is known for um, the, the caliber of resident that it has, the level of education, the level of success, um, and the ability to understand complex financial circumstances. Let's just use those as kind of organizing principles, if you will. Not every community has those same degrees <coughs> of understanding on, on those topics. Um, a thing to consider <coughs> is the idea of what I call entrepreneurial governance. That's a term that I've kind of assembled over time and doing the work that I do. Um, and if you are an entrepreneurial government, right, and you act as an entrepreneur, um, you take those actions that are intended to uh, produce uh, investment, right, that yields, that, that has a yield for you, that has a qualitative yield and a quantitative Right? A qualitative yield that feels good now to be here, and a quantitative yield you can measure the yield that you get, in this instance, by Avalon property tax value. Right? That's really the yield that comes from these investments. So entrepreneurial governance as an idea uh, for you as a community, um, and um, being willing to make the investment in your town to keep your tax rate low. So those are different but related ideas. So as, um, as Commissioner Fender mentioned, the kinds of capital projects that I laid out for you, and these are just among a large list of things you could do, right? but these are the kinds of things that you talk about. When you drive home and you see clean water and a view of tree-lined streets right, from somewhere else, it really evidences the value that's represented by certain point. And having a community that has those features that make it a great place. Uh, one of the statistics I look at is the benefit of recreational facilities, for example. So if you have a walking trail, a well-established walking trail, walking is the number one recreational activity in the United States. Um, it has been for more than 20 years now. So, and communities that have well-established walking trails, the same house that's within a quarter mile of a premium facility, which is a, an eight-foot wide path, is usually 10 to 20% more valuable than the same house that doesn't have that access. So proximity to those kinds of features has a direct correlation to property value. Um, and so again, just thinking about the, um, the culture, if you will, of the, of the residents that you, that you represent, they're really investors that you represent, right? They've invested in your community. So, so I'm just thinking in terms of strategy, um, that may be uh, a theme that can resonate um, as you figure out what the right path is. Follow. So the only thing I know in having done this work for a little while is that if you stay out of the game because you don't make that investment, there's a lot of people that are going to be with you staying out of the game um, and not making the capital projects happen. So it's a, it's a discreet decision to decide you're going to be in the game, for example, for pursuing grant dollars and right? making big projects happen with a capital investment to back up that decision, uh, uh, or 
choose to stay out. But there's always a there's always a no build decision with every project, right? And then a build of various types. Um, and so um, and so I just throw this out there as you were describing willingness to consider changing the millage rate, willingness to consider bonding for viable projects that you think are defensible and appropriate, um, and, and willingness to look long term at larger scale capital projects. Those are really very discrete ways to govern your community. Um, and uh, uh, from a strategy standpoint, financing, how you get the money together, is really the other piece. Um, and so you have a couple of options um, that I just am looking for feedback on, and then later we'll come back with how much these things would generate. Okay, so this is in the land of 20,000 feet abstract discussion, and when I come back, it'll be a more discreet discussion about the dollars and the quantities. So, but staying up at 20,000 feet, um, you have different mechanisms. So, um, so, so there's the easiest one to talk about is the tax rate, because you have to do that every year. So there's the have to do things, and then the maybe get to do things. Right? So the have to do things is another great. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Um, it's interesting to hear the millage rate hasn't changed in five years, um, and an acknowledgement that as we build things, there's more of intent. Those, those, those are all just, that never changes. Um, and so knowing the maintenance budget will have to continue to increase over time to maintain quality of life. Um, you have a millage rate uh, conversation to have, I think. Uh, which is really to focus on those maintenance obligations, but not capital, because you're not going to be as successful with receiving millage for, for capital. Um, and then the other pieces of the equation, user fees, MSTUs as special mechanisms, right? Stormwater utility that can include a fee, um, and bonding um, to put together a work chest. Those are kind of the pieces I think that reasonably would be available to you um, as a town. So, um, so comfort levels in those areas, not commitments, but just comfort levels in using those mechanisms, um, is, um, is the other thing that I'd like to get feedback from you on as we work with the team to figure out you know, what those things might yield for you um, and how they would be layered if you go to the so not one of them. Yes, could you, because Commissioner Campo is waiting to say something, but before we get to that, I want, could you go through quickly for each item besides millage rate, because we all fully understand that, um, the user fees, the MSTU, stormwater utility fee, and the bonding, those are the other options you laid out. Just a quick summary of how it works sure. example, just before we get to that, please. Easiest one is bonding, right? So, so bonding is identify a set of projects, determine the cost for those things, right? Determine the total capital cost. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, you would, um, through referendum, okay, um, given your size, through referendum, ask the voters to support your acquisition of a bond to pay for discrete capital projects. Okay? So, whatever those things are. Okay? So that's okay. all. Okay. Um, um, I would imagine your rating is very high. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. a good time to bond for local governments. With the stimulus coming up, I think probably it gets better. Um, but it's a decision that you make, right? Mm -hmm. um, a long term commitment, it's typically a 20 year bond. That's kind of the rule of thumb. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, um, there, are some, um, there are some benefits you can get by using um, ICMA, um, using um, uh, the county might be of assistance in bonding. I don't know what your financial circumstance is. Uh, but you have some partnership opportunities. But you're a pretty, you're a pretty solid community to go and your bonds. Your rating is high, and so that's that's an option. That's okay. Option. So you have ten million dollars worth of capital projects. They will be paid for with this bond. You have to go to voters. The voters give you approval through referendum. You secure a bond. Um, you then are positioned not just to pay for those things, but then go after grant dollars with a dedicated source of funds. A war chest that you've established. Okay? That's kind of option number one. Okay. Um, option number two, let's say, using an MSU, a municipal services taxing unit, um, is a um, kind of a user fee based mechanism, um, <coughs> pardon me, that is differentiated by type of project. So the county has several MSUs in place, for example. Um, MSUs can be used for stormwater. 
MSUs can be used for roadways and transportation facilities. MSUs can be used for police and fire. Uh, MSUs can be used for schools, educational facilities. So those are funds that are differentiated by category of use. Um, they are they are perpetual. They're on the tax bill. They sign out the one. Okay. Um, and so, <coughs> pardon me. Um, it is an act of your commission to establish an MSU. I don't believe you would be required to give your money. No. And that will confirm that. But Michelle shaking her head no. My understanding is no. So that's a decision by your board uh, to put an MSU in place. Um, the default use. The reason why I included MSUs for you to think about um, is that's how the county finances its Connect Protect program. So the county has um, committed to extend sewer service and keep rates at $12,000 max per homeowner. So to do that, it draws from MSTUs that are, by the way, I should mention, drawing from a defined geographic area. I should mention, MSTU has a defined geographic area. So a specified area of the county um, then has an ad valorem base fee that's generated um, that is used for capital projects that happen in that the specified geographic area. Okay? County's mechanism is already in place. Um, the county, through the conversations that I've participated in and getting ready for today, is certainly willing and eager to work with the town to accomplish this countywide improvement, or countywide benefit, really, which is connected with that. Um, and um, that is a um, uh, that is a, an act of the commission. It goes on the tax bill. Um, it tends to exist usually in perpetuity over time. You can also use MSTU dollars to pay for some maintenance as well. Mm -hmm. If you annual, annualize the maintenance, you can pay for some maintenance through that. And Joe would confirm that. Joe, is that accurate? Does the county use MSTU to pay for maintenance? It I know it can be defined. where they do. And so I'll confirm the ability for you to use dollars to do that sort of to pay for maintenance as well. Right. Bonding is going to be one-time capital investment. And if I can build on that, just to give a better uh, kind of an outline, if I may, Mayor, the MSBU option would be great for the South Sewell's point, should you decide to do, give them a benefit that's only for them, like a septic to sewer conversion, and that way your north part of the town is not paying for that direct benefit. Right. So it's a, it's, a defined, it's a defined improvement for a defined district, and then that district pays for that to Michelle's point, that's exactly the mechanism the county suggested. Gosh, if you want to accelerate, here's an easy way to do it. We're doing this in these other places in Martin County. Now, you know, you can piggyback with us um, and, and, and take that through interlocal agreement and then action by the county. Um, so that's bonding, that's MSTU. Could I ask a question, quick question about the bonding? I just wanted to be sure I understood it. Um, are these the kind of bonds that uh, you uh, you have to spend the money within yeah. three years or something so that there's tax-free, that kind of thing? Um, there are variable bond options that you have, um, and so some of them are time-limited, depend depending on interest rate, and others give you a longer period of time. Okay. Um, do you have a history of bonding? In yes, the and uh, sir, I mean, this might, bonding might be the last thing we look at. It certainly comes with a lot of qualifiers that we would have to adhere to, a lot of hoops to jump through. Uh, we'd have to have financial mitigation plan, which we actually are in the process of creating for you. We're just going to bring it back in the, in the end. And um, they, the rating also includes the stability of your management, the stability of the commission, the relationships with the outside agencies that you will be rated on much more than just your financial background. And also they'll take a look at what we have in reserves and how we're planning to spend those reserves. And so uh, where we might uh, believe that we have, would have an option to have a good rating in the beginning, once we start taking a look at the projects that we currently have planned and the amount of money that we currently have planned to take out of the reserves, I would, I would say that we would have a challenge to get a great bond rating uh, with that information without having an increase in revenue stream somewhere else. So the first discussion needs to be how to create that revenue stream that's going to secure an opportunity for us to have a good financial mitigation plan to offer for bond because we get reviewed. Okay. And, and, and these aren't the rating easy to hard, by the way. Okay. Right? And to Michelle's point, bonding is easy to explain the most difficult and can create bigger impacts okay. for, your, for your ability to work. Sounds like bonds need to have a good long discussion. If you'll just quickly summarize the use. Stormwater utility was the other. Yeah. 
Stormwater utility fee and a user fee, and then Commissioner Campo has been waiting to. Stormwater utility is a dependent unit of government that you create and control. Um, stormwater utilities um, include the master plan for the town, which you want to undertake anyway, I would think, given the um, certainly the resiliency impacts of King Tides. Um, so you master plan the community as in terms of stormwater needs. You identify capital projects to address those needs. A stormwater utility can levy um, a stormwater fee uh, based on ERUs or equivalent residential units. Okay? Um, it can vary between commercial and residential because there are different effects between commercial and residential. That one is one of the things that makes it attractive because commercial properties can carry an equitably appropriate burden um, versus a, an equalized um, uh, an equalized rate um, across uses. Um, Stormwater utility fee, again, can, um, can levy, um, can be established by action of the commission. It doesn't require a referendum. Um, you would adopt a utility, you would adopt a stormwater, establish a stormwater utility, you would adopt a stormwater master plan for that utility, and then you would establish a fee within that utility, okay? So it's, um, it's, a, it's an annualized cost that is on the tax bill. You can vary the rate um, by, uh, on an annual basis. Stormwater utilities can bond also. So at, at some point in the future, if bonding becomes desirable, the utility can take out that bond, and there's some advantages for that taking place versus the municipality taking on a bond. Um, it's also a mechanism that makes you um, often competitive for certain types of stormwater grants. Granting agencies like stormwater utilities, um, they're a best management practice, especially in the state. Um, and so um, uh, those dollars can be used for capital and maintenance. Many communities utilize the stormwater utility to maintain projects with so a very specific rate. You calculate your maintenance, and the maintenance dollars come from that end. Okay. okay. Um, so that's stormwater utility fee, and was there other user fee? Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, and, and I, um, user fee really is going to come from, <coughs> pardon me, um, more of a special assessment district mechanism, which is similar to an MSC. Okay. So, um, okay. And, uh, and a special assessment district. Um, is a, can be an assessment district or a benefit district, but they really mean the same thing, where you identify a set of improvements that can either be specific or by category, so you're not limited in saying we must use the special assessment district dollars to pay for this specific set of things. You can have some flexibility mm -hmm. in what that district pays for, like for example, stormwater, um, resiliency measures, transportation measures, um, and then um, that special assessment district is established by your commission, doesn't require a referendum. You identify a set of projects, you initiate the special assessment district, and then you can modify that over time. Okay. Okay. So those are the different types of mechanisms. Um, uh, and um, <clears throat> when I come back to you, one of the documents that I'll bring back to Michelle, the a little matrix that identifies those different sources and what a typical rate would generate for your town to give you kind yeah. of that content. That would be awesome. Thank you. Commissioner Campo, we a long time. Thank you. Well, thanks for going through those options. I think for this stage of the game, we should probably just stick to the word debt because even if we were to do a, like a $10 million debt, it's just, uh, it's too small to actually be a bond. And the cost for bond council is so extraordinary. Uh, I think what we would probably end up looking at would just be a loan from a bank. You know, but we could just call it debt. Um, and and I think when when the bank underwrites that, or let's just call it the lender, uh, what they specifically look at is the ad valorem. So let's say just operating, we have a three million dollar budget. Two million is ad valorem, and the rest are you know sales tax, building fees. So. Just like in any other loan, the lender is looking for collateral. Well, they're going to want to use our general obligation, you know, for the ad valorem. So they're going to, in a sense, want us to almost um, encumber our general uh, ad valorem revenues. And I think when you do that, it triggers a referendum. So I don't want to get into like, you know, the line in the sand, but I think that's part of the what their process is going to want and hey it helps us too but the main thing is that's part of now if we go to a bank as a municipality 
you've heard of municipal bonds where you have to pay, you know, no, in, you don't have to pay income tax on your municipal bonds. Well, what the bank does is they get a credit because they're lending to a municipal institution, which means that they could lower the interest rate. So, um, but the, you know, I know we may have authority to do these things, but if we're really talking about doing something extraordinary that we haven't done in the past, I mean, there's a, a reservoir of trust that we've built through the community. And I know when I did the North Sewell's Point septic to sewer and was running up and I, we got in the, the House budget, the Senate budget, and the governor didn't get in the budget, and Pam Walker says, it's going to take an act of God to get this. And the whole time, everyone's meeting, like, what's the plan? What's going on? What's going on? Um, it was with a lot of persistence that we built up trust by saying, look, we're not jumping ahead on this. We're waiting until you're on board. We're waiting until you're on board. And look what we were able to do. I mean, with basically no money of town hall, we were able to put in that infrastructure. We've got record hookups, $8,000, no, no trees knocked down. I mean, we've really got a lot to show for it. But that reservoir of trust is built because we're talking with people like John Tompek campaigning and saying, hey, here are these issues, trying to keep our ear to the ground. The fact that there's no one here is a sign that there's trust. But that trust has been built through the years. So I think if we, if we gun this thing, if we get, come across as heavy handed, then we lose that trust and then it makes it harder for folks in the future. So, but I am, like I said before, I'm open to looking at all those. And I think you being able to take those vehicles of revenue and doing multipliers times our tax base or um, other methodologies, I think is what we need next to see like, you know, what's this going to result in in dollars and cents. If we had an MSTU fund and pay off the capital improvements from a loan, I, I, I see that as, as a viable option. And again, we have to make the case that you're getting something for this. This isn't just going to, you know, enhance um, bureaucracy, but the road's going to be smoother. You're not going to have your roads flood and we're going to have a cleaner river. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, town Manager. Thank you, Mayor. It's Cheryl, can you pull up that working, it's a working document, but I'd like to start with um, building on what Vice Mayor has just outlined, which is true and accurate. And uh, one of the great things that I want to share with you is that the county is currently working with the town specifically for what he just outlined, which was that uh, finding this way for the county to assist with fronting what we'll call the seed money on certain projects, and then going to the state revolving fund group and asking for an amendment on there on the county's application, which would be inclusive for Sewell's Point. And then at that point, when that money comes in, then that would reimburse the county for the seed money that they put out on behalf of the town and then potentially, you know, future funding options. And as you know, last time we looked with the state revolving fund, it was a 0.5% uh, interest rate. And through the county, it's at 0.1% at this point. So it's, it's as low as we're going to get for <laughs> borrowing money. Yeah. Now, the drawback on that is that it does, uh, they have certain um, qualifiers that they pay or things that they pay for. So I think they don't pay for repaving. So we'd have to look at those kind of details, but that's part of our other project that we're looking at. So what I have in front of you is just a seriously rough thing that when Kim and I and Cheryl were having discussions about what kind of documentation we're going to need to bring back to you in the future this year, these are just options. These are not like, you know, I don't want to create panic and say, here's everything, but this is how you, you know, decide where we get the biggest impact and potentially where to go. And so, you know, when Kim was outlining areas like franchise fees, uh, Vice Mayor had mentioned in a previous meeting, we have not dedicated our FPNL franchise fees to anything at this point from a policy standpoint. So you have that opportunity to utilize that uh, when going out to for debt or to a bank. And so, you know, keep that in mind that you have that opportunity as well. But when we take a look at what we currently have out there, our communications 
services tax that's available now is not maxed out and hasn't been. It's been the same for like 12 years. We currently budget a revenue stream of $50,000. If we increase that to what the state allows as the max, which is what every municipality and agency in, that I know of has done in the state of Florida, that brings us to 5.1% and the increase is $33,000. Now, it doesn't seem like a lot of money, and that's because our tax base is small. I mean, we have a small town. If you take a look at the road impact assessment, we've already discussed that. That goes right to the building department, but that would enable us to take care of more paving of streets, repaving of streets, repairs, and even uh, potentially street sweeping, which we have received a lot of complaints recently with all of the construction going on, that our residents would like more street sweeping occurring. That would give us an additional $55,000 a year. Uh, under ad valorem, I know this is a tough one, but we're, if we were able to dedicate this by policy, specifically to say one mil for your public safety, that would assist to pay for all of your fire fee and the grand majority of your police department freeing up monies for your capital improvement plans. And you could do that by policy. And if you took the other mill and dedicated it to stormwater, you wouldn't need to create a stormwater fee. It would be in lieu of creating a new fee. And again, it's by policy. And it would still keep you under five mills, which is still the lowest in Martin County out there. And it generates potentially an additional 1.36. That's that's significant for our, for our budget. So a total potential increase just in these items without even dedicating FPNL franchise fees is at 1.448. And I wanted you to see what that looks like. This is part of what we'll bring back to you in the future and part of what we'll be discussing when we go into the budget year. Anything else with that? Thanks, all right, thank you, Town Manager. Commissioner Tompak? Yeah, just a quick uh, clarification. A referendum is not required for an MSTU? I think for an MSBU where it's a uh, benefits, I don't believe a, re a referendum is necessary. Okay. But we can verify that. Yeah, I wish we would, because I, I seem to recall that uh, some of the uh, ones that they've done in St. Lucie County, they did have a a referendum they need like no, no. 50, I mean, I 51% of the people had to say they want them. that. Yeah. You're right. You're right. So because it's for a specific area, it's just um, we'd, we'd have to work with the uh, constitutional officer to get that done prior. You're correct. That okay. is true. <clears throat> and I that a dedicated millage and dedicated by policy is not necessary. So you're saying there is a referendum necessary for the MSTU. Okay. Commissioner Fender. Are you, I'm sorry, Commissioner Tomback, are you done? Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Just back to your spreadsheet for a second, uh, town manager. Yeah. Well, let, it, let, us, let us clarify okay. that because we'll, we'll come back to that. we have a conflicting opinion that it's not mandatory. It's just something that many, many counties do, many cities okay. do, but it's not okay. mandatory. Just uh, flip back to the, the spreadsheet for a second. Whoever the flipper is. I think she's must be. <laughs> flipper and a jogger. So, uh, uh, I like all these ideas uh, for what they're worth. To me, they're numbers on a page, and I, I, I fall back to uh, the vision required in order to justify modifying. Uh, but I think modification is possible if there is a clear vision of what is to happen with the funds, other than just saying, we're going to raise some funds and make some more money. Uh, we need to know what that funding is going to. And I wonder if adding additional line item of annexation might add a few more bucks to the spreadsheet as well. You know, we've got Sewell's Landing to consider and also perhaps the Dolphin Bar. So I don't know what you can... Uh... I would love that. I keep trying to see if I can gain any interest right. from somebody. Yep. I keep saying we can go across the water too and see who we can pick up. If, if uh, Marriott's going away, maybe somebody else would like us to <laughs> Oh, there you go. Now you're talking a big swing. Um, uh, well, your mayor has a tie-in to Sewell's Landing, so I'm I just do. <laughs> I like that idea too. Um, are you good, Commissioner Fender? For now, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say before I get to Commissioner Campo, um, 
two areas make sense to me the um, finding funding to have dedicated funding for matching grants because that is the way we have been operating and we have a giant expensive project going on and we kind of just wing it in terms of hoping we have the money to match these grants which is kind of our main source so it seems financially responsible and fiscally responsible to dedicate some source to match the grants if this is how we're going to pursue our money so to your point you know there are areas where to Commissioner Fender's point there are areas that we do need the money for it's not something that we have to we're doing it now in terms of showing the residents what are we doing we're doing it now and we need money for this so I feel like there there could be better education you know getting it to us talking just putting it out there but the project is occurring that we do need money for if we want to continue on with it um, and then the stormwater utility fee that just makes sense that's just like cleaning up after yourself I mean we're doing all these projects and there's so much maintenance and maintenance makes for a good clean town that improves property values so I think a, you know some kind of stormwater utility fee to just maintain nicely the projects we are doing I think that makes sense um, Can I use for street sweeping, by the way? Yes. Street sweeping was mentioned? yes um Commissioner Campo yeah a few things um, first I want to go back to uh, uh, Dave's comment regarding the whittling down the 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 wish list and I, I think that's probably f the first uh, go around and I I hate to break it to Frank but I think the first thing is the 12 million dollar under underground utilities I mean I just <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> no, that's just a big juicy <laughs> well but, but um, I'm not I'm not sure about that now and I'll tell you why it's because no well we just we in principle I think you're right but at the same time if all of a sudden we're going to be trenching instead of directional drilling you know septic to sewer conversion there may be a, a financial opportunity there to put in either electric lines or a gas line if if you can do a common trench so I don't think you necessarily want to throw that out immediately okay I suspect, well, I suspect you're still probably right yeah but it's worth looking at I mean guys we have two million dollars of ad valorem per year and you're talking about a 54 million dollar wish list I mean you know it would be nice if we could do everything and throw in you know ice cream underground to travel to each person's house you know but 54 million I can make that happen for 54 million no I'm kidding uh, so I, I think we need to start whittling down before going after 54 I, just as fantasy um, <laughs> To go to you know our culture, which you know I pride myself on, of five years of no ad valorem increases, and to say, oh, but the year after that it doubled. You know, that's 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 a non-starter for me, and I'll say that the statute requires a four to one vote if you're going to have an ad valorem increase of twenty percent. So yeah. you're going to lose me right away. So um, as far as um, I know I'm chasing a little bit of a rabbit here, but when we think when we have an opportunity to uh, unlock the value of this development, so the, the, the development that we were looking at, what was the name of it? The North of India Lucy? The landings. Oh, no, no I'm sorry. Ban North Banyan of India Hill. Lucy. Banyan Hill. Banyan Hill, okay. Since that project is off the, uh, off the table and I no longer have a conflict, I'd like to say that it's a shame that we could not have taken advantage of building that out because that would have unlocked a lot of uh, tax base. I mean, we might not be able to annex uh, Dolphin Bar, but that acreage, which is, you know, who knows what the tax base is now, but we could have probably quadrupled, you know, the amount of tax base because we had six lots that would have had probably four million dollar homes and a couple three million dollar homes on the on the river and they've now scrapped that so I think while we're on the topic of annexing let's look at the undeveloped property that we've got and think like we're all business people I mean think about four or five of us and even uh, Michelle got very entrepreneurial roots and to think that you know we I think we killed the goose that laid the golden eggs there and now to think, you know, that how many years is that lot going to sit there and not get developed? So we've got to think like, what was the word? Entrepreneurial? Entrepreneurial governments. Entrepreneurial governments. 
it's 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 a wonder and I have friends that are on cities and boards and we're all business people but then when we get up here we turn into you know government telling people what to do and shutting down development and that would have been a really nice you know shot in the arm to get the building fees for six homes and um, so that's that's just kind of a simple thing before we get into creating new taxes and referendums and bonds and MS to use it's just thank you you're welcome Commissioner Kurzman Madam Mayor, yeah. I don't think that the commission can't, that discussion came to the commission, so I'd rather. Okay. Yes, because that is an issue that yeah. we need to not talk yeah, about that one anymore. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say, no. Commissioner Kurzman? Okay. Um, I have uh, just. And then wait, I, I want to just. Staff's going to stop. You what? I thought I have one more slide I wanted to show you, and then staff's going to stop. Okay. Fine. Okay, well, I'm going to um, just say one thing. I, One of the reasons I was really looking forward to this, too, when we're talking about you know, looking at funding is we are, and I just said this, but I want to reiterate, reiterate it. We are doing currently a large expensive project that I really believe needs to get done. I think most residents agree it needs to get done. We fund this through grants, which is a very shaky matching process where the stars have to align. And when I look at the budget, I don't see where our revenue is coming to help in that way that we choose to fund our project. So this is a good chance for us to you know, really think seriously about how are we going to do this project that we're all committed to. Stormwater was number one last year. So I encourage you guys to really, you know, in the whole millage thing, you don't necessarily have to do that, but let's talk seriously about, you know, taking care of what we're doing. So that is my request to the other commissioners. Mm -hmm. And town manager? Ma'am, that's, yes. uh, that's exactly <coughs> where we were going. So uh, Cheryl's going to pull up for you just a quick slide, and we won't take any time on it. But this reflects the next year for us. And if you take a look at what the town has uh, committed to pay, uh, that will use up all of our reserves, which is why we're having this discussion with a sense of urgency. So I really appreciate the high level discussion that we're able to have on policy and the ability for uh, the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council to come and help us put all of these ideas and priorities into a specific blueprint. Uh, but, you know, the years and years that we've been able to benefit, whether it's residents or a town, at having a low millage rate have uh, been a source of pride, but it's also brought us to where we are now, where it is this year that we need to make a decision on how we're going to be able to pay the bills this year. Okay, and we can speak about this more in a future meeting. Okay. And, this, and we'll send this out to you. So okay, thank, thank you, Town Manager. Um, Kim, is there anything else you wanted to add? I think it was wonderful. So thank you for your input. This is the okay. opportunity to chat with you this morning. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we will work with Joe and Michelle. Um, we will continue yeah. to assist in your discussions with the county to get as much information as we can okay. and bring back to you um, our capital projects budget um, that um, CapTech is going to generate those estimates as your town engineer okay. um, and, um, and the different funding sources that are available to you and what each of them might do. Okay, so that's what's going to come back to you. Your workshop is April 13th, um, and so we have some work to do between now and then. Um, we're, of course, I'm always available if there's a desire for a council member or a member of the commissioner or a member of the public that, that, to provide more information. So, uh, uh, so please don't hesitate. My contact information is on the next slide. Um, okay. but otherwise, all my communication will go through Michelle directly, of course, um, to anyone that um, wants to have that conversation. And then I'll be back on the 13th uh, with um, some numbers for you to consider um, and some more specific, uh, more specific policy opportunities. Thank you, Kim. I really appreciate it. And Bonnie, can I ask you a question? Um, because you were scheduled at 1130 and, you know, it's our fault that we're running behind. Are you averse to a five-minute quick recess or would you rather no, keep I going? Think that's, I think that's good for the recess technology. We would appreciate it. Five-minute recess, bathroom break. Thank you.
are See ya. calling the meeting back to order. Bonnie, thank okay. you very much. All right, so my name again is uh, Bonnie Landry, and I am your planner. And we're going to have a little change, a little bit of change, and that we don't have the public here. So what I'm going to suggest is we advertise it better, and make probably not a Saturday, and we'll do this again. But I think it's a good exercise for, to get your preferences to begin with, and then we'll run through that exercise with the public, and then we'll also have it available on the website. So okay. um, let's get started. And so the purpose of this is to get some broad preferences on your long-term planning issues. This will inform your update to the comprehensive plan. Uh, the information that you show today will be tallied and it will come in graph form and we'll be able to put that on the website. And you'll also see as you go live results. So what you have before you is a sanitized clicker in a Ziploc bag. You can use it whichever way you want, feel safest. Um, you'll see that there's num uh, letters that correspond to each question, A, B, C, D, et cetera, for uh, multiple choice, and then true and false. One is true, two is false for true false questions. Um, you're going to see that the pad will light up green that to, to indicate that your response has been sent. Red is an invalid choice if you accidentally hit the wrong key. And you, it will only uh, record one vote per person. So if you hit it three times, you're still only going to get one, one uh, preference. Okay. So we're going to start with a test question to test both the technology and your clicker. So the first question is, what is your favorite candy? M&M's, Hershey's Kisses, Reese's Pieces, Candy Corn, Red Hots, or none of the above? Begin poll now. And I can't see it, but it does look like we have five responses in poll. And so it looks like M&M's was first choice. No candy corn? No, nobody, no, no red hots, no candy corn. And someone doesn't like candy at all. <laughs> someone doesn't like candy at all or any of those choices. OK, next, next question. OK, when you were in elementary school, what mode of transportation did you use to get to school? A, walk to school, B, you bike to school, C, you took the school bus, or D, you were a car, car rider, meaning your parents drove you. And the answer is, most of you walked to school. You were eating m and <laughs> While you were eating m and But what will be interesting is the next question is what mode of transportation now do either your children, grandchildren, or people in your neighborhood use to get to elementary school? And it looks like walk okay the responses are in whoops and interesting that many of you the kids here take the school bus that's oh, good that's awesome. awesome okay so where do you live north Sewell's point or south Sewell's point point? and i'm going to let heather you can do the graph because i can't see if all the response but it looks like the responses are in there's a real problem hundred percent of you <laughs> <laughs> that is but right. obviously when we have when we have the, the public here it's yeah. probably going to be a little bit of both okay so and some of you are, have already talked about this but what is your favorite quality about Sewell's Point beautiful views access to the water activities like fishing and boating tree canopies and other established landscape safe neighborhood E all of the above that is a we could add that yeah. but you have to pick just one Jeez, damn it. Okay. To make a choice. <laughs> All right. All right. Oh, it was, so everybody likes, it looks like almost equally, um, safe neighborhood obviously is the first choice, but it was very well, so, uh, looks like y'all like all of that. Next question. In January 2020, during the public involvement process, um, one thing identified was hometown feel. What does that mean? Does hometown feel mean a place where I belong? A place where the community is cohesive, you all group together? A place where I know my neighbor? Shared history, shared values, or community events? What does that mean to you? Okay. 
Cohesive community it was the first, the most preferred answer. And obviously we have a short amount of people. <laughs> okay, what transportation facility in the town of Sewell's Point needs the most improvement? Uh, roadways for cars, sidewalks for pedestrians, bicycle lanes or shoulders for cyclists, or public transportation, which is bus stop. Which, which do you, would you like to see the most improvement? And it looks like roadways what? was first choice, and uh, facilities for cyclists was second choice. Yeah. <laughs> true or false? I am happy with the quality of my drinking water. A is true, B is false. And it looks like most of you are happy with the drinking water. Next question. Oh, it is up there. I am uh, true or false. I am happy with the treatment system of my wastewater, meaning I'm happy with my sewer or my septic system that I'm using. And it looks like most of you would see improvement in wastewater. True or false. I believe the town boundaries should increase, meaning I think we should annex additional property into the town. And it looks like many of you think annexation is a good idea. What strategy do you feel is most important to reduce pollution? A, encourage and facilitate recycling. B, reduce littering. Uh, C, replace septic systems with sewer. Or D, reduce carbon emissions, which is fuel efficient vehicles, hybrids, electrics, or other travel modes such as uh, cycling and walking. This is just for our town, correct? This is just for Souls Point, yes. <laughs> We're starting small. Yes. Point, then, the world. then the world, yes. <laughs> You can all the same. One. I mean, they all got to get done. But you have to pick the one that you think is most important right now. Okay. All right. All right. And it looks like the septic to sewer was the first choice, second by we need to encourage more recycling. True or false? I am pleased with the availability of park, public parks and open spaces in Sewell's Point. True or false? <laughs> With the availability. Well, you could read that a lot of ways. <clears throat> and it looks like, for the most part, people are happy with the parks and open spaces. 13, one thing that the town needs is, and you can only pick one, <laughs> so which one do you think is most important? A diversified economy, a greater tax base, better roads, better schools, more retail, more restaurants, or grocery stores that are closer. And the preference is uh, greater tax base is uh, most preferred, second by very close second to better roads. Uh, I believe the town needs tougher regulations related to tree protection, building and home design, uh, building and home design standards, meaning you have specific architectural features. Uh, fencing, the types and height of fences, open space requirements, or none of the above. Looks like for the majority of people do not think we need tighter regulations on any of those particular things. Second by tree protection and fence requirements. True or false, the town has a good working relationship with Martin County and its surrounding communities. So that's intergovernmental relationships. And the majority think that you're doing very well in your intergovernmental communications. True or false, I'm happy with the amount of funding the town budgets, in, so this is from the per public's perspective, 
for projects that improve existing facilities or build additional facilities that are needed to support the town. True or false? And it looks like it was a, a very strong no. So it looks like more funding needs to be budgeted. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, true or false? I believe the town of Sewell's Point has properly planned and prepared for sea level rise and related flood risks. True or false? High tide, storm surge, flash flooding, stormwater runoff. False, so it looks like that's an area you'd like to see some improvement. Okay, this is a long one. Smart growth, uh, you probably already know, so I'm not gonna read that because this is really, you've, you've dealt with smart growth. Smart growth. So which of these strategies could you support as far as smart growth goes? Reinvesting in and maintaining existing infrastructure, neighborhoods that are close <coughs> to shops, offices, schools, and encourage alternative automotive, alternative travel modes to automobile or provide a, a range of different housing types that make it possible for residents to age in place. Um, senior citizens can stay in their neighborhoods, young people can afford their first home and families in all stages can find a safe, attractive home they can afford. Or D, none of the above. So it looks like the first one was reinvesting in and maintaining existing infrastructure followed by uh, mixed use neighborhoods near uh, neighborhoods near homes near shops, and then none of the above, none of those uh, smart growth features. We're almost done. Okay, which of the following best fits your opinion about conservation land? Uh, A would be I believe South Florida Water Management District and DEP have adequate regulations in place to protect the environment. B I think the town of Sewell's Point should exceed these standards or Dixie, I have no opinion on this matter. And it looks like B, they believe the town of Sewell's Point should exceed these standards followed by um, A and A and C, which was no opinion or that uh, the state and federal agencies regulations are, are sufficient. Next, according to the EPA, wetlands are, and I don't even need to read this because you know what wetlands are, which of these statements uh, best describes your philosophy about wetlands? A, I believe wetlands, regardless of their size or health, must, be, must not be impacted. B, I believe wetlands that are part of a connected system should be protected, but small wetlands could be impacted if the developer improves or expands an existing wetland system, or C, I have no opinion about wetlands. And it looks like it was pretty well split between A and B, uh, with C being last place. Uh, next question, what would you describe as the most important legacy for Sewell's Point? So what, this is what you're going to leave. A healthy environment, a sustainable economy, clean and, clean and safe drinking water, access to quality life amenities, safe and prepared community, sense of place, equity and social justice, quality, responsive town services, mobility and connectivity options. So you pick the one you, you feel strong, most strongly about, the legacy you want to leave. Wow, so that was, that was pretty uh, strong that you want a healthy environment followed by safe and prepared community. I believe this is the last question, yes? Which statement best fits your view about accessory dwelling units? These are uh, guest homes or garage apartments. A, I encourage this use because it supports multi-generational housing like elder care or extended family. B, I would encourage this use because it could provide more affordable rental units. C, both A and B. D, I would not encourage accessory dwelling units. Or E, I have no opinion on this matter. A 
and it looks like many do not have an opinion, followed uh, by they don't want accessory dwelling units or they like that it provides housing for multi-general uh, families, <laughs> elder care and extended family. So this concludes the preference polling. The graphs and results will be posted shortly and we will probably wait until we do this with the public before we post it. But it's a good exercise for you to, to know where your, your standing on these matters are. Um, we're also, after we, we do this with the public, we're gonna have it available on SurveyMonkey, which would allow people who don't wanna come in and, and poll, they could do the, the questions online. And then this, the results of this will help uh, uh, inform the comprehensive plan, the update to the comprehensive plan. And I thank you so much for your time I today. I pushed the wrong button on one question. But we, we, could, we could go back and change it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we start over. Exactly. Hey, we, we did that pretty quick. That was 22 questions. Um, Bonnie, I've got to say that was really fun. And now that we've done it, I mean, ideally we would have had more public care, but um, having us do it, I can now encourage everyone to come to the meeting or do it online because I think it's a great little exercise to give information to the town and you guys and for yourself. Yeah, and I, and I like that you can see it as you go because you yes. kind of see how other people in the room are thinking. Yes. So it does help gain consensus. So. Yes. But I thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. Any commissioners want to comment? Are you guys good? That was cool. All right, um, I know it is not on the agenda, but Michelle, were there any staff comments? Or are we all good? Uh, Madam Mayor, we are good unless there's something that the commission needs from us. I want to thank everyone for coming on Saturday. I thought it was fun to kind of change it up. So I appreciate everyone making the effort and um, I will adjourn the meeting.